De Hampley reports. Charles Saatchi, who's 70, had claimed that images which showed his hands on his wife's throat were part of a playful tiff during an intense debate about her children. The photographs, published first in a tabloid newspaper, were taken as the couple was sitting outside a restaurant in Mayfair in London. In a statement last night, the Metropolitan Police said officers from Westminster's Community Safety Unit had been aware of the article and had carried out an investigation. The statement said a 70-year-old man voluntarily attended a central London police station yesterday afternoon and accepted a caution for assault. A disabled woman from Luton has collected more than 45,000 signatures on her petition against cuts in care. 28-year-old Angela Murray lives at Abigail Court in Biscuit, which used to be warden-controlled. She says the new regime of drop-in care is forcing her to live the life of a pensioner. Here's Tony Fisher. Angela was helped in setting up the online petition by the charity Scope. Both parties joined forces when they appeared together on the Ian Lee Breakfast Programme in March. Angela is calling on the government to fund social care so she can lead as normal a life as possible. The government is due to make its decision as part of its spending review at the end of this month. The Milton Keynes Parks Trust is planning to sell some of its land to developers. The seven paddocks in Great Linford will be used to build houses and a community centre. The Trust's chief executive is David Foster. It would be easy for the Parks Trust just to carry on doing what it's doing and cut the grass and keep it as it is and a lot of people would like that but we're trying to bring about improvements and we're talking about you know for the next thousand years and the the facilities that, that are there in Great Linford aren't appropriate and aren't suitable for for the long term. Sport now and in Rugby Union, the British and Irish Lions play their final warm-up match ahead of uh, Saturday's first test against Australia this morning. They'll take on the Brumbies in Canberra at 10.30. The weather cloudy with sunny spells, scattered showers and a top temperature of 23 degrees Celsius at 73 Fahrenheit. Get the latest news and sport online at bbc.co.uk slash three counties. Just do you think it's a good use of taxpayers' money? Just tidying up a little bit, Catherine, hang on a second, sorry. Taxpayers' Money, 20 meteorologists meeting to discuss whether there's been some bad luck. I've seen some of two, we've been promised something. You spelled that wrong, you spelled that wrong. No, 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 shush, 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 please. We've been promised something. Um, oh, this decent is twice in the same sentence. We'll have to go with decent. it. Have you written off summer? I'm done now, Kath, thanks. You're welcome. This is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. It was a bit of a last-minute dash to come down to the studio today. We were having so much fun in the office. Yeah, right. Uh, lots coming up on the show this morning, including... The Miss World competition is gearing up. More contestants have been chosen for the international final in Indonesia. And guess what? Miss England is from Bishop Stortford. But are beauty pageants demeaning to women? The fight against plans to build the high-speed rail link through Buckinghamshire could cost Aylesbury Vale District Council a quarter of a million pounds. Well, do you think it's a good use of taxpayers' money? And 20 meteorologists are meeting today to discuss why our weather has been so bad. I don't know why Zeus isn't going to be there. The last decent summer was 2006. We're being promised something half decent, too decent on Wednesday. But on the whole, have you written off summer? If you remember, summer was yesterday morning up until about half past 11 and that was it. Well, lots of ways to get in touch. Facebook.com forward slash BBC 3CR. You can uh, send me a text, 81333. Start your text 3CR. Please put your name on it. Or can we get a phone call? Like in the first 15 minutes of the show. Let's see who's keen. Are you keen? We should award a prize for the f- first person to call the show. There's no prize, but you'll certainly get my respect. 08459 455 555. Across beds, hearts and bucks. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. So this year's Miss England winner is Kirsty Hazelwood from Bishop Stortford. Congratulations. Well done, Kirsty. I've seen pictures of her. She's very, very beautiful. Uh, As a result of winning, she'll be representing England at the Miss World final later this year in Indonesia. But permission to speak freely. I was surprised that Miss World is still going. I didn't know it was still in in existence. I thought that we'd all woken up about 12 years ago and gone, oh, yeah, it's it's a bit rubbish, Miss World, isn't it? Really? It doesn't really serve any purpose. Why do I need to hear a beautiful woman in a sash saying things. It's still going. Well, what do you think? 
beauty pageants, old and young, male and female, are they a little bit outdated? Is Miss World demeaning to women? 08459 four double five five double five. Well, Justin Dealey, you are our beauty correspondent. Oh, Justin, where are you? Justin? I'm here, Ian, You're don't you worry. Three. I'm just looking at this dress. Kirsty, oh, Kirsty. Um, so, what a lovely dress that is. Oh, now, listen, so you're everything that's wrong with humanity <laughs> in so many ways. It's just a bit of fun, come on. It's it's the lowest of the low, it's very, very tacky, but that's why we love it. Look at the TV shows that we like. Now, we both love that TV show filmed in Luton, Splash. Very, very yes. tacky, but equally what? as wonderful to watch. No, 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 hang on a second, because in Splash, we are seeing people learn a skill they're learning mm-hmm. something they're learning how to dive with miss world and i'm not in any way denigrating uh, miss hazelwood who is going to represent us at all hesselwood actually hesselwood if you don't mind thank you very much indeed <laughs> well you've done your research have, yeah. you never normally why have you researched yeah, this story so thoroughly just for the purpose of the bbc you know? uh, uh, we, uh, for miss world all it is is hot girls yeah in dresses, yeah. or in bikinis, mm-hmm. always in a sash. Yeah. And also, the girls, Hazelwood, Miss Hazelwood is very attractive, but quite often you see better-looking women at bus stops. That is very, very true. But, you know, when it comes to these competitions, surely they learn how to carry themselves. And I find it very suspicious, actually, that um, we are surrounded by women at BBC Three Counties Radio. And when this came up yesterday, not one person said, oh, should we have her in the studio? Mm, just a little bit suspicious. Some women find these competitions very, very offensive. And I don't know why. I don't know why that is. Are you suggesting that the women who work here, who may or may not be beautiful, it doesn't matter because they they do blooming good work, almost as good as some of the men that work here. Exactly, yes. Are you suggesting that they may be... What, they're jealous? What what, what point are you making, Dealey? If this would have been a man, this person would have been booked to come in the studio today. But yesterday, when it was suggested about her being from Hertfordshire, no, let's just do it on the phone, shall we? No, no, no. I said, why don't we get her in the studio? We can take a photograph with Ian. We can put it on Facebook, it's it's a big international story, this. No, no, no. no. They, 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 let's just do it on the phone. No, you, let's get her in the studio. You really are, um, Justin, you, with your with your smokes and your attitudes to women, oh. you really are a sexist pig, aren't you? No, not at all. I think you're talking about yourself there. However, um, I have been on the streets of Hertfordshire. I've been asking the ladies, are beauty pageants outdated? The very fact that you said, I've been asking the ladies. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> that, would, that would back up the statement I just made. I have been asking women on the streets of Hertfordshire, are beauty pageants outdated and a disgrace to women? And here's what they had to say. Yes, I think they are. And that's why? I think it's because there's more to people than just how they look and um, how they're dressed. And uh, I don't think it's right to, to judge someone just on appearance. So when you see these photographs in our newspapers, does that offend you? Do we really need to have to see people who make every other women feel inferior, maybe? They're not a disgrace, they're just very dated. From the 70s and 80s, I think. Yeah. I don't like them, personally. So you think we should move on? Yeah, time to scrap something, them something different, something to do with, I don't know, it's like bigger and better, not yeah. all about beauty, because everybody's beautiful. Doesn't matter, does it? So these pageants just stuck in the past. They are very stuck in the past. Very, very. I think I remember pictures from the fifties that my mum showed me, (laughs) and even then it's a bit like, oh my god. But now, no, no. I just, I think you can find beauty in other ways. I honestly think there's very pretty girls and a lot more better, stunning people than that. So you think it is a bit outdated then? Yes, very. Mm. Just outdated. I wouldn't say disgraced. A little bit. But it doesn't bother me, it, and it never has when I was younger, but, I mean, if they've got it, you know, flaunt it. As long as you don't expose yourself too much. But it doesn't bother me. I don't watch it. What, how does it further the cause for women, Justin? What does it achieve, apart from going, hey, if you're really, really slim and quite good-looking, then you can wear a crown? Well, it gives you recognition, surely. For what? Well, we, for, for, for being somebody who holds themselves well, who, who's beautiful. You could say that about any model. You could say, well, what, why is somebody, if you walk down into your local high street, you've yeah. got all the shops there, all the major brands, I don't know, Marks and Spencer's H&M, you could say to somebody, well, why is that person in the shop window no. What are they getting from that? Because there are better looking girls at the bus stop. You can have the same argument for that, surely. I like big butts and I cannot lie. I think yeah. I'm quoting Cat <laughs> Stevens from 1972 there. I like shapely women. Well, these yeah. aren't real women that we're seeing in Miss World, Justin. Why are they not real women? 
well, I mean, I, I'm looking at the other photographs here, and she's a very curvy lady. She, she's not. She's not. She's a size not. Four. Cur- she's, Daily, a cur- she's not curvy. No, I'm looking at other photographs. Oh, I'm like actually going to fall out with you this morning. Why? Because she's not curvy. She's not a real woman. We're, we're not talking about somebody who's a size zero, who, right. who young children will look at and say, oh, that she, she's so skinny. I want to be like that. She, she's not incredibly skinny. Not, let's, let's, she's let's an attractive not, woman. Let's not. She is an attractive. Let's not focus on curvy. Let's generalise this. Yeah. But I, I think you're outdated, Justin. And I think, I think this morning that more people are going to phone in and support me than you. 08459 455 555. We shall see. We shall see. And at the end of the show, we'll decide who's right. Mm, in the car park, nine o'clock. Sweet. A little bit of James Taylor to calm us down. What a fiery start to the show. I do apologise. In my mind, I'm gone to Carolina. Can't you see the sunshine? Can't you just feel the moonshine? Ain't it just like a friend of mine to hit me from behind? Yes, I'm gone to Carolina in my mind. Karen, she's a silver sun. You best walk her away and watch it shining. Watch her watch the morning come. A silver tear appearing now I'm crying Ain't I Gone to Carolina In my mind There ain't no doubt In no one's mind That love's the finest thing around Whisper something soft and kind And hey babe The sky's on fire I'm dying, ain't I? I'm gone to Carolina in my mind In my mind I'm gone to Carolina Can't you see the sunshine? Can't you just feel the moonshine? Ain't it just like a friend of mine To hit me from behind Yes, I'm gone to Carolina in my mind The dark and silent late last night I think I might have heard the highway calling Geese in flight and dogs at bite The signs it might be omens Say I'm going, I'm going I'm gone to Carolina With a holy host of others standing around me Still I'm on the dark side of the moon And it seems like it goes on like this forever You must forgive me If I'm up and gone to Carolina in my mind In my mind I'm gone to Carolina Can't you see the sunshine? Can't you just feel the moonshine? Ain't it just like a friend of mine To hit me from behind Cause I'm gone to Carolina BBC Three Counties Radio. So the challenge has been laid down. Justin Dealey thinks that Miss World and other beauty pageants, they're fine in 2013. There's nothing dated about them at all. They're acceptable bits of entertainment that, that show off women. Whereas I think they're rubbish and they're a bit demeaning and they're, they're very dated and they're pointless. Whose side are you on? 08459 four double five five double five is the telephone number. <laughs> Travel news for beds, cards and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. Good morning. The M1 London-bound queuing 
after an accident a little bit earlier this morning. It has been moved to the hard shoulder now. This was between the Luton Airport Spur at Junction 10 and Redbourne, the A5 at Junction 9. The good news is all lanes have reopened. All traffic was being held for a time until around 6 this morning, so you're on the move now, but it's still quite slow past there. The A14 in Beaconsfield, roadworks taking place between Lakes Lane and Piebush Lane. No delays yet, but it'll probably get busy later this morning. Trains doing fine. Tubes, though, Bakerloo Line running with minor delays between Queen's Park and Harrow and Wealdstone after a signal failure earlier this morning at Queen's Park. Adam Glynn, BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you, Adam. Speak to you in 15 minutes. Right, 6.16. Uh, it is Tuesday the 18th of June. I'm Ian Lee. These are your headlines on BBC Three Counties Radio. Leaders at the G8 summit have warned Russia it risks isolation unless it agrees to a joint statement on Syria. The Culture Secretary, Maria Miller, will hold talks this morning with leading internet firms about finding ways to restrict access to harmful online content. In sport, the British and Irish Lions play the Brumbies in Canberra at 10.30 this morning in their last match before the first test against Australia. I don't even know what sport that is. Coming up, we'll talk about a very serious meeting that's taking place today. It's about the weather. Britain's top weather specialists will be discussing why it's so blooming awful. If you've got any thoughts on that, 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. Next week on the BBC. Starting to show the strain. Under immense pressure. A yell. A little scream right there. Those legs are getting heavy. It only hurts so much. This is a desperate last stand. Because they want it so bad. Wimbledon starts next Monday across the BBC. And boy, oh boy, I hope you watch that whilst listening to BBC Three Counties Radio and ticking your rage our diary. But, 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 am I the only person in the country that doesn't like Wimbledon? When Wimbledon fortnight means dull TV fortnight. It means TV schedule is all messed up for two weeks. I just don't, I, I don't get Wimbledon. I went there once years ago. Ah, it was kind of all right, you know, but really... The whole nation gets set up for excitement only to be let down at the last or the penultimate hurdle again? Everybody digs Wimbledon. Apart from me. I dig Cat Stevens. Matthew and Sam 
I've never been working all day, all day, all day. Cat Stevens, I do love Cat Stevens, but I also like 60s Cat Stevens that gets completely overlooked because of 70s Cat Stevens. They're virtually two different people. Now, the Met Office is calling a highly unusual meeting today. 20 of Britain's top weather specialists will be discussing why the weather is so bad at the moment. Although some decent weather has been predicted for Wednesday. Wednesday! The record books show us that the last really hot summer was seven years ago. Well, our reporter, Nick Codling, has been braving the grey weather to find out if people in Bedfordshire have given up on the British summer. Would you say you've given up on summer? I have given up on summer. It's too cold and I've still got the heating on at home and I'm fed up. I want some sunshine. Have you been staying indoors more? Yes, I've had my bikies by the side of the house and hasn't actually got past the actual back gate because it's been so bad. Yeah, the sun hasn't actually come this year, so I don't know, fingers crossed, let's hope, maybe August, maybe September. Is there any summer activities you haven't been able to do? Barbecues, definitely, seaside, definitely, theme parks. Have you given up on the British summer? No, not at all. For I'm optimistic for Glastonbury next week. Is the grey weather not getting you down? No, of course not. It was pretty decent last week. The week before was even nicer. What would you Florida. say to people who were just like, oh, I hate the weather, it's all, all rubbish? It's quite warm. Put your shorts on and have a barbecue. Yeah, I've given up on British summer because it's been like this for the last four years, hasn't it? You know, listen, years ago when I was a kid, you'd pack your winter stuff away and you'd have your summer clothes out. But, you know, I've got all my clothes in the wardrobe just in case. Have you had any barbecues, that kind of thing? One. How was that? Um, the weather was alright actually and it started raining a bit later on that night so yeah I got the barbecue out of the way in the, in the lunch time. So. Have you given up on British summer? It's not looking good is it? Last year we had all the rain, this year it's just been really cold and windy and I think people are just sort of either really depressed or just heading away for holidays. Just a real shame isn't it because the winters have been shocking so you just need the summers to perk up, keep you positive and happy, see you through. But what are we, middle of June now, and still no sign of any decent weather, so... Summer was yesterday morning, that was it. Do you remember those two hours of sun? That was it. I hope you enjoyed it. Well, Norman Lineau is a chartered meteorologist and past vice president of the Royal Meteorological Society. You try saying that at this time in the morning. Norman, why, why, um, has, why has summer been so rubbish? Um, well, good question. Um, I think really what's happening is we're reverting back to what is our more normal summer weather. Um, over the past, I don't know, couple of decades, there's been quite a, quite a number of quite quite hot, sunny summers. But they're the anomalous ones, uh, the unsettled ones are the more normal in this country. The last hot summer, the really hot summer, was 2006. What a year it was. D- do we have to accept that, that it's prob- we're probably not going to get that again? Oh no! These these will come back occasionally, but they are the they are the slightly anomalous ones. Um, uh, but right through uh, historical times, that there have been occasional very very hot, dry summers, and will continue to get these. But they they will only come around every few years. They're, they're certainly not the norm. Um, what we're having this year is much closer to the usual. For the- this is the norm. It's the middle of June, Norman, and uh, it's miserable, it's grey, maybe we get a little bit of sunshine for a couple of hours. It was raining yesterday a little bit. Is this what we have to get used to now? I think that's what we've always been used to in this country. Uh, I'm, I'm of an age where I can remember the summers of the, of the 60s, which were a lot worse than this one. Do people need to lower their expectations? Absolutely. Uh, we're, we're not a country that gets hot, sunny summers, unfortunately. This, the, this Met Office meeting, Norman, I don't know how much you know about it, but w- what's it for? They can't change anything, can they? They can't change anything, but uh, we're in this somewhat odd situation in that uh, globally temperatures have risen over the past century. That's fact. There's no argument about that. Um, and if you change the global temperature, um, you can expect some changes in, in global climate. Um, but when you start looking at a very small part of the globe, which the British Isles is only a dot in the, in the globe, it's very difficult to say whether or not uh, these global changes will make it warmer here, colder here, wetter or drier. It, it really is impossible to say. And whether or not the particular weather we're getting this year is directly attributable to, these, uh, to this warming trend, who knows? Uh, this meeting 
it's certainly right and proper that the that it's the subject is discussed, but in in all honesty, I can't see that any really meaningful conclusions will come out of it. And it says that twenty of Britain's top weather specialists will be going. Who who's in this twenty? Is Sean Lloyd one of them? Who are these top twenty? I don't know, but I'm certainly not one of them. Well, listen, uh, Norman, that is bang out of order. We should certainly do our best to get you there. Norman, I appreciate you uh, coming on. That's uh, Norman Lionel, chartered meteorologist. Well, have you written off summer? Do you listen, apparently this is, this is kind of the way it is. We should get used to it. Those nice summers we've, we've had in the past, they're the freakish ones. This is the norm, according to Norm. 08459 four double five five double five. Have you written off summer? <laughs> Three Counties Radio. So the two big questions at the moment. Have you written off summer? It's pretty poor. This is as good as it's going to get. 08459 four double five five double five. Beauty pageants, Miss World and the like. Really? Come on, it's 2013. I've had a falling out with Dealey. He thinks they're great fun. I think they're just sexist, dull, pointless, dated nonsense. 08459 four double five five double five. Travel news for beds, cards and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. The M1 southbound still queuing after an accident earlier this morning between Luton Airport at Junction 10 and Redbourne at Junction 9. The accident's been moved to the hard shoulder, but the queues remain for the moment, although all lanes have reopened. Everything moving fine on all the other major roads, though we've got no M25 problems through the roadworks, all looking well on the M40. If you're travelling by Tube in London this morning, Bakerloo Line, minor delays, Queen's Park to Harrow and Wealdstone after a signal failure at Queen's Park early this morning. And looking at the trains, just one cancellation so far today, the 641 service from Watford Junction up toward Crewe, which was cancelled because of a train fault. Everything else looking great. Adam Glynn, BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you very much, Adam. It's 6.30. Here's the news and sport now with Catherine Boyle. Across beds, hearts and bugs. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. Good morning, it's 6.30. The headlines, leaders at the G8 summit have warned Russia it risks isolation unless it agrees to a joint statement on Syria. The Culture Secretary, Maria Miller, will hold talks this morning with leading internet firms about finding ways to restrict access to harmful online content. And a disabled woman from Luton has collected more than 45,000 signatures on her petition against care cuts. Three Counties Sports. BBC Three Counties Radio. 
Former Luton Town boss Joe Kinnear is in hot water after once again talking publicly about his as yet unconfirmed role as director of football at Newcastle United. Speaking on radio, he was asked to respond to the comments of fans unhappy about his return to the club. He responded by saying he had the contacts to pick up the phone and speak to any manager in the world and he's due to meet Newcastle boss Alan Pardew today. Peter Odenwinge has told the BBC he expects to leave West Brom this summer. Odenwinge, who was heavily fined by West Brom for various comments on Twitter about the club last season, says, says he's looking to move on. We're talking now, my representatives, you know, are in uh, talks with uh, West Brom and uh, where we'll end up, I don't know yet, but most importantly, you know, if uh, I have a manager who will um, assure me of playing time, you know, it's the last years of my football career, I want to make sure I'm active. And Wickham Wanderers manager Gareth Ainsworth says he expects to bring in some new faces over the summer. You're in the region of sort of three uh, or four if we can um, to add to this and uh, and we'll see but there's parameters on that of, of how much we we uh, we pay players and if we get players cheaper we can sign more if we if we sign big names you, you know it, it takes a bit chunk of the budget up and we can only sign a few then so there's all sorts of things going on but I've got a lot of bases covered. And in Rugby Union, the British and Irish Lions play their final warm-up match ahead of Saturday's first test against Australia at 10.30 this morning. They're taking on the Brumbies in Canberra uh, in what wing Shane Williams says will be the toughest match of the tour so far. Of course it's going to be difficult, but with professional rugby players, we've all got to make sure that we're fully prepared mentally for this game because you know we don't want to let anybody down. We want to go up there and give it 100%. It's going to be tough, but we're fully prepared to give it our all and job. do what we do best, really. It's that, your job. It is. It's, it's, it's good. It's good. Sorry, have you not finished? Um, that's your latest news yeah. and sport. More for me in half an hour. It's going to be tough. Yeah, that's your job. So what, don't you just do it. If you don't, if it's too tough, why don't you go and do another job? Yeah, go go and work in Tesco's or something. If you think you're up to it, oh, it's going to be tough. This your job is rugby. Just do it mentally prepared. You're very brave when they're in Canberra. Yeah, I didn't even know what sport it was until he said the word rugby. Um, now, I want a word with you, Boyle. Yeah, go on. What's this I hear about you only working a two-day week, you're not in for the rest of the week? Yeah. Why? Um, my mother-in-law... Here we go, listen to this, I can hear your brain working up an excuse. <laughs> go on. My mother-in-law yeah. has gone on holiday. Oh, so you which have... Which I think is an outrageous thing to do. So you have so to have some I'm time lum- off. I'm lumbered with looking after my own children. Oh, you shouldn't have got pregnant then, should you? <laughs> your I'm fault. not moaning about it, I'm quite pleased but you only had some time off a couple of weeks ago i'm allowed oh because you're a woman no because it's my allocation oh right sorry about that anyway (laughs) across beds hearts and bucks this is ian lee bbc three counties radio Uh, if only if only i had the power to play a jingle in the office when she was talking to me and shut her up if only unfortunately i don't i can't stop her talking upstairs that's the problem morning ian lee bbc three counties radio coming up in the next 30 minutes or so we'll be talking about stuart hall's sentencing we'll also be uh, discussing miss world outdated boring dull slightly sexist concept or just a bit of fun oh eight four five nine four double five five double five should we have a look at the front pages of the newspapers yes we shall. The Independent. Um, the Independent. PM warns Putin he faces isolation over Syria. David Cameron made a final attempt to bounce Russia into supporting a future for Syria without President Bashar al-Assad last night. David Cameron telling Russia they, they, they face being left out on their own. Do you think Russia really ca- Does Russia really care? That it's going to be on its own. Putin's going. Oh my goodness, David. Ka- hey guys. Hey comrades. Cameron has just sent me a text. We're going to be left out on our own if we don't get in line with uh, with Europe. Do you think he really cares? Of course he doesn't care. He's Putin. He's bonkers. Exposed. This is the Independent as well. The doctor whose faked drug test results proved fatal. A British doctor faked test results during clinical trials for an asthma drug in which one person died and others contracted cancer and pneumonia. Oh. The Guardian. Time running out for Syria peace deal, Cameron tells G8. Um, And there's a a picture of uh, uh, Barack Obama. Uh, I hate it when they do this. Barack Obama and David Cameron with some school kids doing a painting or something. Did you hear Barack Obama's um, speech yesterday at G8? It was like a really bad stand-up routine. He was talking about how he'd met his Irish cousin, his eighth cousin, called Henry. Or as I call him, Henry VIII. Sycophantic laughter ensued. And he talked about the last time they went to Ireland, they spent time in a bar, and Michelle learnt how to pull a pint of black. Q 
make you sycophantic laughter. I wouldn't open with that one, for goodness sake, Barack. Uh, the Times is a picture of Barack Obama pointing at a child. Cameron leads West to ambush Putin on Syria. The Telegraph. Different uh, stories. Porn loophole. I've seen that film. Porn loophole gives animals more rights than women. What? Animals and corpses have more rights than women when it comes to being used for internet pornography. A coalition of women group, women's groups warned today. David Cameron must close a legal loophole to ban possession of pornographic images that promote sexual violence against women and girls, they say. In a story completely unconnected on the front page of the Daily Telegraph, Saatchi is cautioned for assault. Uh, and quitting EU would damage Britain. The Daily Express. There's a paper missing, isn't there? What is it? No, do not. Oh, uh, the Telegraph. The Telegraph's missing. Where's the... Who stole my Telegraph? The Daily Express. Diabetes risk in red meat. Oh, here we go. Oh, for goodness. Another thing we can't eat. Thanks, uh, uh, Daily Express. Danger soars by almost 50%, say scientists. Regularly eating red meat can dramatically raise the danger of getting diabetes, says a new survey. And Nigella's husband accepts a police caution over his choking assault. The Daily Mail. An insult. We'll talk about this in a few minutes. An insult to all his victims. Sex predator Hall will serve just two weeks in jail for every one of the thirteen girls he attacked. Stuart Hall will serve barely two weeks in prison for each of the young girls he sexually abused. The sentence prompted a wave of outrage and fury last night, with victims saying it made a mockery of their horrific ordeal. We'll have more on that in a bit. In the Sun. Um, have uh, ignored the sentencing story and gone for Hall groomed me with joy of sex manual when I was 12 uh, beaming, be- beaming BBC pedo Stuart Hall is seen with a girl he groomed at the age of 12 by making her read The Joy of Sex one of the most horrifying books of all time 08459 455 555 
this is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. 08459 four double five five double five is the telephone number if you want to give me a call. And I think you'll certainly have an opinion on uh, this. This is on uh, the front page of a couple of the papers. The Shadow Attorney General has asked for the 15-month jail sentence given to the BBC broadcaster Stuart Hall to be reviewed. Reviewed. Uh, he's admitted he'd admitted indecently insulting girls as young as nine over a 20-year period. Well, Emily Thornbury has written to the Attorney General asking him to refer what she calls the unduly lenient sentence to the Court of Appeal with a view to increasing it. The maximum sentence for many of these offences at the time was two years, but some of these girls were younger than 13 and the maximum sentence for them would have been five years. So I think that the court needs to consider that. I think the court also needs to consider, I think there were 14 offences that he, he pleaded guilty to. Should all those sentences run at the same time or should some of them run one after the other? And in that way, the sentence can be greater than 15 months. She says Hall's offences were aggravated by his pattern of behaviour over a long period of time, his abuse of trust and his very public denials. The BBC says it's appalled that some of his crimes happened in connection uh, with his work at the corporation. 08459 four double five five double five. Do you think the sentence was uh, unduly lenient? We're joined now by Pete, uh, Peter Saunders, Chief Executive of NAPAC, the National Association for People Abused in Childhood. Good morning, Peter. Good morning, Ian. Peter, what's your view on the sentence, 15 months? Well, I think I agree with the uh, the Member of Parliament that you just spoke to a minute ago that it was an undue, l- lenient sentence. He could have been given more. He could have had consecutive sentences for the many crimes that he committed. So I think he's got off lightly, and I hope that the Attorney General will will review the sentence in the light of all that. Because the devastation caused to the victims, believe me, I work at NAPAC, we hear from victims every day. What they live with often lives with them for a lifetime. For some of the things, well, for, for all of the things that, that halted, 15 months does seem, it does seem very lenient. What, what kind of message do you think that sends out? Uh, well, it, it, it says we, we're not taking, the judiciary are not taking these crimes seriously. Um, you know, it, 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 I can't think of a worse crime than to attack a child, particularly a young child, but any child, and then to be given, you know, if you or I went out and shoplifted Ian, I bet that's the sort of sentence we'd receive. Um, and yet somebody can steal the innocence of so many children and, and get away with a 15-month sentence. It, it sends, if, the, if, 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 if signal's the right word, it sends out a signal to, to other potential perpetrators that they might just get away with it, and even if they get caught, they're going to serve a few weeks in prison. It's not right. What was partic- I mean, the, the, the crimes are hideous, of course. What I found sure. particularly hideous about the whole Stuart Hall thing was his, um, when he, it first came out and he was accused, yes. was his complete disregard for the victims. Nothing to do with me, Gov. They're liars. Oh, they're all liars. Pernicious liars. Callous lies. Yes. This is typical abuser behaviour. When cornered, they turned vicious, and Stuart Hall turned vicious and showed his true colours. Do you think there is any chance, uh, uh, Peter, that, that, that this sentence... I know you're not, not from a legal background, but that this sentence sure. could be increased? Oh, it could be, absolutely. I know people already who are appealing to the Attorney-General to review the sentence, and I think if there's enough public pressure... I mean, the law is supposed to work for the people and to protect the people, and if the law has let us down, then we need to tell the lawmakers and the law implementers that they need to do something about it, and I'm sure that they will. And Peter, I I know the answer to this, but for those who don't, there will be people saying, well, hang on, his first victim was 45 years ago in 1967. What? Really? It happened so long ago, shouldn't we just ignore it? Why why does it take so long for some people to come out and and, um, report these acts to the police? Ask our Jewish brothers and sisters whether they think it was right to go after the Nazis many years after the war. Of course, we have to go after people that commit these crimes. And again, um, to to relate it to another kind of crime, if you or I had robbed a bank 20, 30, even 40 years ago, Ian, the police would quite rightly track us down and put us behind bars. Time is irrelevant. Peter, I appreciate your time this morning. It's Peter Saunders, Chief Executive of the National Association for People Abused in Childhood. Well, we can talk about it freely because it's happened now. 15 months. 13 girls he attacked. Um, youngest, uh, uh, the youngest victim was nine. Fifteen months? Is that is, is that uh, too lenient? What's your thought on this? Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five. Travel news for beds, cards, and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. 
two problems this morning on the southbound M1. First off, a lane closed. There's been an accident with two cars and a lorry involved between junction 13 at Bedford and 12 at Flittick. The inside lane is the one that's closed off. Nick gave us a call about that one and it's looking busy. Further down southbound, we've got queues after an accident a little earlier this morning. That's been moved to the hard shoulder, but it's still busy from junction 10 past Luton Airport toward 9 for the A5 at Redbourne. The congestion pretty much back to junction 11 at the A505. Heading into London, the A1 through Boreham Wood already queuing from Stirling Corner down toward Mill Hill Circus. Trains running well, but on the tubes, the Bakerloo line has minor delays. Queen's Park to Harrow and Wealdstone after a signal failure at Queen's Park early this morning. Adam Glynn, BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you very much, Adam. Right, 6.46, it's Tuesday the 18th of June. I'm Ian Lee. These are your headlines on BBC Three Counties Radio. Leaders at the G8 summit have warned Russia it risks isolation unless it agrees to a joint statement on Syria. The Culture Secretary, Maria Miller, will hold talks this morning with leading internet firms about finding ways to restrict access to harmful online content. In sport, the British and Irish Lions play the Brumbies, Brumbies, I think I've got their second album somewhere, in Canberra this morning, in their last match before the first test against Australia in the game rugby. Coming up, I'll be talking to the Royal Buckinghamshire Hospital. It's reopened. But before that, here's the weather with Kate Kinsella. Beds, hearts and bucks weather. BBC Three Counties Radio. Good morning. Well, some of us have got some brightness this morning. We can see the sunshine through that high cloud, so some milky sunshine. But the cloud is going to thicken. It's going to come and go through the course of the day, and we could see some potentially quite heavy, sharp showers moving through as well. But the temperature is slowly starting to increase. Maximum today, 23 Celsius, 73 degrees in Fahrenheit. Now, overnight, it's another humid one, I'm afraid. Generally rather cloudy. There's a lot of it around, and that could lead to one or two quite heavy showers uh, being produced, particularly towards the early hours of tomorrow morning but the minimum temperature staying in the mid-teens 13, 14 Celsius so quite a sticky night now for tomorrow we'll still have one or two showers around in the morning but they should clear away and we'll get some brighter spells some sunny spells similar to today actually really but the temperature that little bit warmer we're looking at a maximum of 25 Celsius 77 degrees in Fahrenheit the more town-based locations uh, so you're going to get the warmer temperatures are going to feel that little bit more humid so a really sticky day the cards for tomorrow. That's your forecast. If you've got a problem with a company, a council or an organisation, there's one man you should come and speak to. You've got a problem with a mattress, I gather. Tell me all about it without naming any company name. Jonathan Vernon-Smith. Well, every time she tried to book, the trip was cancelled because of adverse weather. The JVS show fights for your rights and tackles your consumer problems. Said send the receipt off and you'll get the cheque in the post. If you need our help... I went to speak to the man that runs this golf club. Email Show at BB. BBC.co.uk. I'm just very pleased that you've got the money. And we could do the same for you. Thanks ever so much, Jonathan. The JVS Show on BBC Three Counties Radio. You know it, don't you? Miss World, all these beauty pageants, they're a little bit outdated. A little bit silly. Justin Dealey thinks they're a great idea. Oh, a bit of fun. They're just for pervy old blokes, aren't they? 08459 455 555. Yeah, baby, it hurts a bunch The girls got going and we 
something up, something up to sweet, some exotic medicine to cure my every ill with some kind of magic pill. BBC Three Counties Radio, 08459 four double five five double five. Now, the privately run Royal Buckinghamshire Hospital has reopened just months after some staff were left without payment of their wages. All the money owed to the staff has now been paid back and new owners have taken over the hospital. It will be improved with better, more varied services being offered to people. To find out more, we're joined by Chris by Allen, who's the chairman of the hospital. Morning, Chris. When did the hospital reopen? Good morning. Uh, we opened about two weeks ago, and we've just started taking the first uh, outpatients clients into the physio and the hydrotherapy areas. What changes have taken place compared with how the hospital was run under the previous owners? I think the problem the previous owners had is they relied too much on the overseas market and not on the local markets. So we're, we've got uh, units in three different counties in Hampshire, Dawson, and Surrey. So we're bringing the skills we've developed in those areas into Aylesbury. So we're very much focused more on the local market and the national market rather than just the overseas market. Uh, how many staff have you employed, uh, Chris? And have you, have you taken on any of the, the previous staff? There was about 50 to 70 previous staff. Uh, we've engaged or we've been in touch with most of them. Um, but until we get the bulk of the new residents in, all we've been able to do is take on about half a dozen of the old hardcore staff. And we've got the rest waiting in the wings because it's important we re-engage with the local employment rather than just go abroad again. Uh, and can you guarantee, Chris, that you won't get into the same problems that the, the previous owners experienced? Uh, unfortunately, um, the previous owners, they just focused on one narrow market. We've got about five different markets. Um, we work very closely with Stoke Mandeville consultants who are the spinal cord specialists. But we've also brought our own complex needs such as MS, Huntington's, Parkinson's. So we've got a much wider client base. Plus which we're not reliant on the same level of debt as the premier centres had. We bought the hospital for cash and we're going to put about another three million into it over the next 12 months. And do you think that people might have reservations uh, about working at the hospital after what happened previously? Well, I think we've all got reservations. When a business has failed, the first thing you want to try and understand is why it failed. But it had nothing to do with the skills of the team uh, or the client group. It was purely financial reasons that the premier centres failed. So... Having addressed those, we don't have the same concerns and we're already engaged in the existing staff. We've got half a dozen on the books already. Chris, thank you very much. Chris Byland, the chairman of the Royal Buckinghamshire Hospital. Day after day, I'm more confused. Yet I look for the light through the pouring rain. Though that's a game that I hate to lose And I'm feeling the strain Ain't it a shame? Oh, give me the beach boys and free my soul I wanna get lost in your rock and roll and drift away Oh, give me the beach boys and free my soul I wanna get lost in your rock and roll And to think that I'm wasting time I don't understand the things I do The world outside looks so unkind And I 
I'm counting on you to carry me through. Oh, give me the beat, boys, and free my soul. I wanna get lost in your rock and roll. you've given me I want you to know I believe in your song in rhythm and rhyme and harmony you've helped me along making me strong oh give me the beat boys and free my soul I want to get lost in your rock and roll and drift away Give me the beat boys and free my soul I want to get lost in your rock and roll and drift away BBC Three Counties Radio. Hey, hey. Stuart Hall, 15 months, is that good enough? I think we know the answer. 08459 four double five five double five. And Miss World and other beauty pageants. Miss England comes from this area. Well done, but, 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 but. Really? It, they're a little bit dated, aren't they? 08459 four double five five double five. Travel news for beds, cards and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. Queues on the M1 southbound. First off, a lane closed. An accident with two lorries and a car involved between Junction 13 at Bedford and 12 at Flittick. The inside lane being the one closed off. And as you continue southbound, there's heavy traffic from Junction 11 at the A505 down toward Junction 9 at Redbourne after an accident earlier this morning which is now on the hard shoulder. All lanes have opened but it's still really busy through there. Anti-clockwise M25 starting to slow up into the roadworks from Waltham Abbey to Enfield, then busy from the M1 to Kings Langley and from Maple Cross to the M40. Slow into London if you're using the A1 through Boreham Wood, Stirling Corner down to Mill Hill Circus. Trains running well but on the tubes the Bakerloo line has minor delays. Queen's Park to Harrow and Wealdstone after a signal failure. Adam Glynn, BBC Three Counties Radio. Adam? Yes? I've just put a, um, an order in for a Marsington bar. Have you? Yeah! Okay. Thanks very much. I'm living the dream here at BBC Three Counties Radio, and someone else who's living the dream is two day a week, Catherine Boyle. On FM, AM, online, and digital radio. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. Good morning, it's seven o'clock. I'm Catherine Boyle. The headlines, Putin warned against standing alone over Syria, a baseball bat used in road rage attack and 45,000 signatures for Luton campaigner. BBC Three Counties Radio. Russia's President Vladimir Putin's under pressure from other G8 leaders at their summit in Northern Ireland to agree a joint statement on Syria or face isolation. David Cameron used a meeting last night to urge the G8 to support peace talks on Syria in Geneva. From Locker and James Robin reports. David Cameron is trying to get as much consensus as possible on Syria after the increasingly strident language in divisive exchanges with Russia's President Putin. The Prime Minister hosted a working dinner last night, the leaders alone, with no officials present to witness the political showdown. British officials now suggest agreement could be close on summit conclusions backing the launch of Syrian peace negotiations in Geneva. It will take more work this morning to agree precise language. 
The army is sending out redundancy notices to 5,000 people in the latest stage of a huge restructuring programme brought about by big cuts to the defence budget. It's the third wave of job losses to be announced and the largest so far. Aylesbury Vale District Council is set to decide whether to pour more public money into the legal fight against government plans to build a high-speed rail link through Buckinghamshire. The local authorities already spent £150,000 fighting the scheme. Councillors will discuss the possibility of spending another £100,000 on the legal battle at a meeting next month. Police were investigating a road rage attack in which a car was attacked by a man with a baseball bat on the outskirts of Dunstable. A motorist was tailgated by a man driving a Vauxhall Vectra on Luton Road last Friday afternoon. When he stopped at traffic lights, the second driver leaned out of his car and struck the front and rear door with the bat before speeding away. A disabled woman from Luton has joined forces with the charity Scope to collect more than 45,000 signatures on a petition against care cuts. 28-year-old Angela Murray lives at Abigail Court in Biscuit, which used to be warden controlled. She says the new regime of drop-in care with early starts and early bedtimes is forcing her to live the life of a pensioner. Experts from all over the world are gathering at the home of a Hertfordshire playwright this week to take part in an international conference. It's being held at George Bernard Shaw's house at Ayant St Lawrence, which is owned by the National Trust. The president of the International Shaw Society, Mike O'Hara, says Shaw's Corner is a magical place. It's like a time tunnel. You come into these beautiful hedgerow country lanes and all of a sudden you could it's like walking into a postcard. Sport now, and in Rugby Union, the British and Irish Lions play the Brumbies in Canberra this morning in their last match before the first test against Australia. Rory Best captains the side. Former Bedford centre Billy Twelvetree will make his Lions debut, along with Brad Barrett and Christian Wade. And Shane Williams starts on the wing after his shock call-up over the weekend. The weather cloudy with sunny spells, scattered showers and a top temperature of 23 degrees Celsius. That's 73 degrees Fahrenheit. Get the latest news and sport online at bbc.co.uk slash three counties. These experts in this time <laughs> tunnel yeah what what i didn't get what they were meeting for or what they were experts in books experts in books and plays oh plays yeah morning this is ian lee bbc three counties radio it's tuesday I slept terribly. I had the boys, you see. My wife was working, so I had the boys. Oh, dear. I, I kind of got to sleep at ten. At five minutes past ten, the youngest woke up. Yeah. Got back to sleep about quarter to eleven. At midnight, the eldest woke up and wanted to get into bed with me. And then at quarter past twelve, my wife came home from work and made lots of noise. Happy days, happy days. Lots coming up between now and 8 o'clock, including the fight against plans to build the high-speed rail link through Buckinghamshire could cost Aylesbury Vale District Council, get this, a quarter of a million pounds. What do you think? Is that a good use of taxpayers' money? The Miss World competition is gearing up. More contestants have been chosen for the international final in Indonesia and the Miss England contestant is from Bishop Stortford. But... In 2013, are beauty pageants demeaning to women? And 20 meteorologists are meeting today to discuss why our weather's been so bad. What do you think? Why has it been so awful? Facebook.com forward slash BBC 3CR. You can send me a text, 81333, start your text 3CR. Or, and this is the best way to do it, 08459 455 555. Across beds, hearts and bucks. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. The cost of Aylesbury Vale District Council fighting the high-speed rail link, HS2, could reach a quarter of a million pounds if councillors approve an increased spending plan. Well, to date, the council spent £150,000 challenging the scheme, but in July they'll decide on whether to spend a further £100,000. Well, if... What do you think about this? Is this a good uh, way to spend money? 08459 455 555. David Thompson is from Aylesbury Vale District Council. He joins me now. Uh, David, but we hear big numbers like 150 grand being spent to date. Where has that money gone? Good morning to you. <coughs> Excuse me. The money has already been spent uh, on uh, technical experts, which are engaged by the 51 group, which is a group of councillors up and down the line opposed to this, uh, this, uh, this uh, pro- project. 
the example for the work that has been done is alternative proposals that would help meet the extra capacity on the existing rail network. The government says is required. Um, this, this alternative is known as the optimized alternative, which we believe the government has not adequately considered. The uh, other half of the funding has been used to challenge the government's proposals through the High Court and the Court of Appeal. What are you hoping to achieve with all this? What are you hoping to achieve out of this, David? Well, we're hoping to achieve. What we're hoping to achieve is to stop this project. It's not going to happen, is it? I don't believe that to be the case. I think there are very many uh, issues, costs uh, associated with this project. Uh, that are still unknown. Do you, do, you, do you seriously think, David, that by spending th- this money, y- you can actually stop HS2 happening? Surely the best you can do is just postpone it slightly. I think that's going to be one of the things that we're looking to do, but uh, the long-term aim has you have to have a goal, and the long-term aim, obviously, is to stop this. There's no business case. The business case for this project doesn't stack up. There's a growing body of opinion, even amongst MPs now, who accept that this is the case. And also the environmental case is also now subject to a lot of questions. What's this extra £100,000 going to, going to allow you to do? <clears throat> the um, extra £100,000 is not going to be used to, uh, on the Court of Appeal, or, well, sorry, not the Court of Appeal, but, yes, the fight to the appeal uh, that we have for the judicial review that we were, we were rejected on. The next stage is about negotiating and what's called petitioning. This is a hybrid bill, and the next stage of the, bi- the, the bill is to petition. Basically, so you're going to be negotiating? Well, you, over you have, HS2? You have, no, no, you don't negotiate over HS2. So if who are you, you negotiating if, with? If, you, if, as you said, sorry to cut across you there, if, as you said, this project does go ahead, and I believe there are a lot of ifs still to be, you know, this, I don't believe that will be the final outcome of this, but should it go ahead, the next stage of this hybrid bill is what's called negotiating and petitioning. Petitioning is the, now the opportunity we have to put forward the mitigation should the government still persist in going ahead. So, so let me get this right. Case. Let me get this right. So, you spent one hundred and fifty thousand pounds in an attempt to stop HS two happening. We sorry, sorry. Can I just contra- contradict you there? We are still spending one hundred. We, ha- we have spent one hundred fifty thousand pounds to still try and stop. This yes, going that's ahead. what I just said. That's not a contradiction. That's that's backing me up. You you you, you intend to spend another one hundred thousand uh, pounds if your initial bid to stop HS two going through doesn't work. And that hundred thousand pounds is negotiations with ways to make HS two slightly better. Is that correct? No, it's not to make not not to make HS two slightly better. I suppose if you what's it for then, David? H- well, it's not to make HS two better. It's to but mitiga- it's, to, it's, it's mitigation for our residents that they have. This is the one opportunity we, as a local authority, and the residents. So have. the hundred thousand pounds isn't to stop HS two being built. No, not at all. So so okay. So the, the part of you does believe. That you can't stop HS2. That no, no, I don't believe that. I then why are you, you spending... You uh, David, 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 you're, you're, you're contradicting yourself. Well, you know, if I'm you not, believe... If you, if, you let me, if you let me... No, I want to clarify this, because you're... you're, 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 you're you what the, what the OK, you can is. speak in a second. I want to clarify this, because we're going around slightly in circles. The hun- if you believe that you can stop HS2 happening, why would you spend £100,000 to negotiate, renegotiate HS2? We're not renegotiating HS2. What, what are you renegotiating, David? I'm confused. Well, if you let me explain, I'll please I'll do. What we are doing is we're going to be going petitioning, and this is, as I said, the one. Who you mentioned the word negotiate? Who are you negotiating with, and what about? We will be negotiating the. We'll be negotiating the mitigation factors required. What does that mean in English? Line, improve the line so that the residents are least affected by this project should it go ahead. So you will be negotiating if HS2 goes ahead. That's what this £100,000 is being spent on. That would be the case. Apologies. I thought that's what I said. Perhaps I, perhaps I didn't make it clear yeah, enough. So I, you I, are I throwing... I'm making it clear to, your, clear to your listeners, and I just want to make that point. Very, I, I don't know clear. if you are, but... Uh, but so you are kind of admitting defeat, then. If you're going to throw another £100,000 to negotiate HS2, you are kind of admitting that the £150,000 to stop HS2 was wasted money. I see this as an insurance policy. You take out insurance for when something happens that is going to be catastrophic or whatever it might be to the family or yourself. This is exactly the same. I see this as an investment that we actually are spending this money to ensure that we mitigate should this line go forward. I think it's quite a sensible thing to do. So you're not very confident you can stop HS2? Sorry? You're not very confident you can stop HS2 then? I'm absolutely confident it'll be stopped. Then why would you spend £100,000? If you're confident you can stop it through your initial act, why would you then spend another £100,000? We have to go through the process, because if we don't go through this process, we are, this is the government's-led process, we have to go through this process. If we don't put anything in, we are basically admitting defeat that it is a fait accompli. 
Now, yes, it could be. I don't believe it to be a fait accompli. I hear what you're saying. It is a contradiction in terms. Yes, it seems to be a contradiction in terms. I'm sure many listeners will feel it is a contradiction in terms. But as I said, it's an insurance policy. Should it go forward, this is the one and only opportunity we have under the hybrid bill. This is the one okay. opportunity. Us, residents of the Vale, and everybody else up and down the line have an opportunity of having their say to mitigate against this daft proposal. Okay, so just to clarify before we move on, you're not completely confident that you can stop the HS2 proposal? <laughs> There's always got to be an element of doubt. We're dealing with people who, this is a hybrid bill, this is the first time okay. ever in the history but so of So you're not country. completely confident it's that you can stop not, the HS2? I, in my heart of hearts, I am confident. As I said, you we have an insurance policy. Prepared to know, throw another £100,000. Yes. At what point, how much do you spend on this, David, before you, you admit defeat? I think that very much comes back from, will come about, we'll have to make that decision when we get the results from the appeal. And the appeal is expected to come back in July and August. So you, you, you could spend potentially a quarter of a million pounds, I think a, so. and possibly more than that? I think we, we would obviously have to go back and rethink, should the, should the government decide that this is actually going ahead, and we lose in the Court of Appeal. I, I believe that the Court of Appeal, that we, the, the appeal that we are going uh, forward with with other authorities and also other bodies, uh, has a lot of merit, and therefore it'll have to be discussed. If you spend all of this money, a quarter of a million pounds plus, and it makes no difference whatsoever, how do you think the locals will feel at having their money wasted? Probably not very happy, but I believe it is money well spent. We have to try and do what's best for our residents so that we, we <coughs> excuse me, um, that we have the, so we achieve the, long, the best long-term benefit for our communities and the local environment. Quarter of a million quid, uh, that could uh, fix potholes, that could, that could do so many things in a local community, and you could just be throwing it away. I'm very glad you mentioned that, because quite frankly, we all know that. I mean, the, this, the, the 51M stands for £51 million pounds for each parliamentary constituency up and down the, the length of the, of the UK. Now, you imagine Bucks County Council have said that they need in the order of something, in the order of between 130 and 150 million to bring the roads back now, to bring the roads back to some decent level of um, uh, maintenance. Now, if we had, we have, what, five parliamentary constituencies in Bucks, not including the two in, in Milton Keynes, that's seven. Seven fives are 35 million, 350 million. A lot of that money could go towards sorting out the problem. Well, also, back, back, to, back to the question, which you, you seem to have ignored or maybe didn't hear, the quarter of a million plus that you're spending could be used to fix roads, could be used to make local communities better, and you could be throwing it away. The, yes, there is that opportunity. There is that possibility. I have to accept that. But I believe it's going it's to a be big gamble, well, isn't it? well spent in beating this. It's a big gamble, isn't it, David? You have to sometimes take gambles in life. With quarter of a million pounds of taxpayers' money? Yes. You're prepared to gamble that? I'm prepared to gamble that because I believe that the, end of the, the odds are stacked in favour of us winning. But as I said, we need to have that insurance, po insurance policy should we not win. And if you don't win, David, and, and the money has been uh, uh, chucked behind a bush, w would you like to come on air and apologise to the taxpayers? Um, I don't think I need to apologise. I think we're doing the best, as I said earlier, for the long-term benefit of our communities and local environment. And that means we have to spend the £100,000 as well, should it go ahead, to, to make sure the mitigation is right. Because, after all, the west side of Aylesbury, outside of the London urban areas, is probably the most, the most area that's going to be affected by this, this rail over line. It's going to run within one to one and a half miles of that area. David, we have to end it there. Thank you very much. I hope you, you feel you got your point across. David Thompson from Aylesbury Vale District Council. Quarter of a million pounds plus. They've spent 150 grand. Going to probably spend another 100. Could spend more. Well, is that good value for money? I suspect, and I, what do I know, I suspect the best they can hope for is to delay things slightly, which would then cost all of us even more money. It's not going to stop it, is it? Oh, wait, four five nine four double five five double five. Travel news for beds, cards and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. Still problems on the M1. Southbound a lane closed following an accident with two lorries and a car involved between Junction 13 at Bedford and 12 at Flittick. It is the inside lane that remains closed there and it's looking busy on the approach. As you continue on the southbound side though, things are easing a little now after the accident earlier this morning between Junction 10 at Luton Airport and 9 at Redbourne. The M25 anti-clockwise busy into the roadworks from Waltham Abbey to Enfield. It looks slow from the M1 to Kings Langley as well. And then from Junction 17 at Maple Cross round towards 16 at the M40 
and even toward 15 at the M4. It's taking maybe 10 or 15 minutes to get through the traffic there. For anyone driving into London, the A1 is queuing from Stirling Corner toward Mill Hill Circus. Train's still looking fine and good news for the tubes because the Bakerloo line now back to a normal service after a signal failure earlier this morning. Adam Glynn, BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you, Adam. Right, 7.16, it's Tuesday the 18th of June. I'm Ian Lee, these are your headlines on BBC Three Counties Radio. Russia's President Vladimir Putin is under pressure from other G8 leaders at their summit in Northern Ireland to agree to a joint statement on Syria or face isolation. The army is sending out redundancy notices to 5,000 people in the latest stage of a huge restructuring programme brought about by big cuts to the defence budget. In sport, one-time Luton boss Joe Kinnear has given an outspoken radio interview about his role as director of football at Newcastle United, which is still to be confirmed by the club. Coming up, beauty pageants, Miss World, Miss England. Is there really any point to them? 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. Every weekday from 12, Nick Coffer brings you... Great guests. Julian Clary. Welcome to BBC Three Counties Radio. Legendary Genesis guitarist Steve Hackett. Super Tramp frontman Roger Hodgson. Carol Decker of Tapau fame joins me now. Great conversations. China in Your Hand is about the fragility of your dreams and that you should be careful what you wish for. Something very addictive about making people laugh is standing on stage and every few seconds getting that hit of a, of a laugh. Nick Nick Coffer. Weekdays from 12 on BBC Three Counties Radio. So I, I don't quite understand how Vladimir Putin is going to face isolation. How does that work? All, all the other G8 leaders won't tell him they're meeting for dinner in the hotel restaurant. And then he comes down at 8.30, sees everyone sat there. Oh, sorry, Vlad, we haven't got... There's no chairs left, you have to sit over there. And as he walks off on his own, they all start giggling. Is that how it's going to work? He doesn't give a monkeys, does he? Really? Now, are you a fan of beauty pageants? This year's Miss England winner is Kirsty Hesselwood. She's from Bishop Stortford, and as a result, she'll be representing England at the Miss World final later this year in Indonesia. Permission to speak freely. I was surprised that Miss World was still going. I kind of assumed we'd stop that about nine or ten years ago. It seems a very dated concept. I, I think... They're a little bit old-fashioned. Are they bad for women, or are they just a bit of fun? Well, Justin Dealey, we, we've disagreed strongly on this this morning, haven't yes, we? Yes, we have. Uh, you're, just you're a bit still, of fun. I'm not finished talking. OK. You're, you're still <laughs> very much stuck in the kind of attitude of 1976, aren't hey, you? Hey, listen, I still go out and buy Engelbert Humperdinck CDs, so clearly I'm stuck back in 1973. But come on, Ian, it's just a bit of fun. It may be a bit tacky, but it's not something that, that I'm going to go out of my way to watch, but it's just a bit of harmless fun. Well, That's all on. it is. Where's come on. The, where's the fun in getting loads of women to walk around in their bikinis and answer mm. inane questions. Well, in actual fact, I'm looking at the photographs, I didn't actually see any bikinis in the swimwear section. So right. I think you better take that back. Well, I'm not They're wearing shorts and uh, tight tops. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's OK, is it? <laughs> Come on, it's just a bit of fun. It's been around for, for, for generations. It's traditional, it's just a bit of fun. Well, that's Justin, Justin we'll, we'll, we'll play your audio in a second. I want you yeah. to, to, to bring in uh, Sally Hughes, who's beauty editor with The Guardian newspaper. Good morning, Sally. Good morning. Sally, uh, it's just a bit of fun, according to my colleague Justin Dealey, and also lots of people listening to the show, it has to be said. Well, there are lots of things, like page three is meant to be a bit of fun. That doesn't make it unoffensive to me. Um, I think the thing about beauty um, pageants, although, yes, they have been around for generations, so that's never a reason not to scrap something. What they do is they line up women on the stage like cattle, and you grade and order them according to how they look purely that, too. I mean, those interviews are complete tokenism. It doesn't really matter what the women say and whether they want world peace and whether they want to work with children or whatever. It's really about how somebody looks. And they don't exist for men in that form. And if they don't exist for men, if we wouldn't do it with men, then why are we persistently doing it with women? And as for, as for children's beauty pageants, I mean, that's nothing short of grotesque, I think. Uh, and when you hear um, uh, Neander, uh, sorry, when you hear men like Justin <laughs> Dealey saying, oh, come on, it's just a bit of harmless fun, how does that make you feel as a woman? 
It doesn't make me angry. I just think it's a bit short-sighted and naive. Of course, it's not just a bit of fun. Of course, the way we view women as a society matters. You can dismiss anything as a bit of fun. I don't, you know, it doesn't make me angry. I just think it's a bit of a shame that people aren't really thinking about what they're doing and what we're consuming. Sally, stay there. Justin, you've been out speaking to people this morning, haven't you, about this? Yes, I have. Um, of course, uh, Kirsty, 24, from Hertfordshire. Uh, she, of course, is now Miss England. I've been in Hertfordshire. I've been asking the ladies there about these beauty <laughs> pageants. Sound, you sound, sorry. You sound like a commentator. Yeah. Next up <laughs> okay. is Kirsty, 24 from Hertfordshire. She's very, she... very attractive. Can I just say, you can't compare Miss England to Paige Stray. You can't do oh. that. You just can't do that. But anyway. Why? I'm... No, no, no. Don't, don't... Why not? Exactly. Why not? Go well, on, Well, because Sally. the ladies who are part of this conversation are not walking onto the stage topless, are they? No, but what we have is an accepted thing in our culture where women are incongruously lined up for us to gawp at and to judge. It is, it, I mean, it's not exactly the same thing, but it's all part of the same old-fashioned culture that we have in this country. So should we ban male strippers then? Well, I'm not into male strippers, but you are going to a specific place. The public are not looking at those men and judging them. You are going to a specific place. I wouldn't ban strippers either. But that's very different from family events where women are lined up on stage and we are asked to judge and order them according to how they look. It's not the same thing at all. What about bodybuilding events? Because uh, men are lined up there like pieces of meat, aren't they? Again, it's a specialist thing. I wouldn't go. It's also a sport. Lots of bodybuilders would take issue with you there, but it's actually a sport. Um, it's a competitive sport. Nothing about beauty pageants has anything to do with anything but how you look. It's not a sport. It's not a skill. It is how you look, how you were born, whether you were pretty enough. The way they carry um, and themselves. You are judged. Oh, it's so graceful. On. It's so graceful. Justin, beautiful. Justin, beautiful. Justin yes. let, 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 introduce your piece, please. Okay. Before Sally hangs up. I've been asking women in Hertfordshire about beauty pageants. I've been asking them, are they outdated and are they a disgrace to women? And this is what they had to say. Yes, I think they are. And that's why? I think it's because there's more to people than just how they look and um, how they're dressed. And uh, I don't think it's right to, to judge someone just on appearance. So when you see these photographs in our newspapers, does that offend you? Do we really need to have to see people who make every other women feel inferior maybe they're not a disgrace they're just very dated from the 70s and 80s i think yeah. i don't like them personally so you think we should move on yeah, should, to scrap them something, something different something to do with i don't know it's like bigger and better not yeah. all about beauty because everybody's beautiful doesn't matter does it so these pageants just stuck in the past they are very stuck in the past very very i think i remember pictures from the 50s yeah. that my mum showed me <laughs> and even then it's a bit like oh my god yeah. but now no it's, no i just i think you can find beauty in other ways okay sally and justin are back with me now sally i i was genuinely surprised that the miss world still went on i thought it stopped in about 2004 no, well, it's so archaic. I mean, it's no longer... Um, they stopped televising it on mainstream television right. here because anybody... I mean, I grew up in the 70s and 80s, and, of course, we all remember it was a very big event on British television. Um, but rightly, I think, mainstream British television stopped um, broadcasting it because it's just, you know, it's completely archaic. It has, it has no um, sense of value towards women whatsoever. It is literally about whether you look good in a swimsuit and whether Bruce Forsyth might date you. And, you know... It, it's, it's got absolute, it holds no stock in anything that actually makes a woman who she is. It is literally about how she looks in clothes. Sally, and I was slightly confused when I saw that you were taking an anti stance because yeah. you are the beauty ed- editor of The yeah. Guardian. So part of your yeah. job is to promote women looking yeah. good. Well, yeah. Is that not I a contradiction? Think- no, to me, they're in no way contradictory. There's absolutely nothing wrong with wanting to look the best you can. There's absolutely nothing wrong with um, having that sort of self-care and self-respect about how you look. There's nothing wrong with feeling more confident in relation to the way you look. But there are many, many more parts of a woman than that. There are many more aspects of a woman's character than how she looks. What beauty pageants do is they are completely reductive. They reduce every woman purely to how she looks and then judge her accordingly i don't judge i advise and i help you know which products might help but i would never judge you based on how you look that's an entirely different principle isn't it something sally that we 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 all do though uh, whether we like it or not we we do make judgments on on how people look don't we 
Absolutely. We walk down the street and we see some, we might make judgments based on that. What beauty pageantry does is it makes that okay. It celebrates that side of our society. It celebrates that sort of unfortunate thing that we do. It does nothing to move on the debate. It does nothing to move on how people feel about women. What it says is actually we can just reduce women to this. Uh, one of the comments on uh, uh, Facebook is from Jenny Goldsmith, who says, I think Miss World promotes a far better body image than size zero fashion models. It should also be remembered that the winner raises a great deal of money for charity. Well, there are lots of ways to raise money for charity without walking around with very few clothes on. I mean, you know, this argument always comes up to charity work. Lots and lots and lots of people work tirelessly for charity without being reduced to a piece of meat on stage. But the, the, the debate about models, yes, I mean, it's a fair one, of course, to talk about the size of models, and that's something we should always talk about. But to be prescriptive about a woman's body shape is offensive, whatever body shape you're talking about. So if you're saying the ideal is Miss World and maybe a sort of size 8... Um, and, you know, a little bit more up top and a few more curves, you can say that, but it's really no different from saying every woman should be a size zero. It's being prescriptive about what shape women should be. Justin, don't you see the inherent problem with Miss World is that we are getting women to stand in front of us and we go, yeah, that one's the third most attractive. Oh, she's Mm. the seventh most attractive. Oh, she's the... Mm. That's what we're doing, Justin. It's just a bit of fun. Now, you you could say programmes, I don't know, like, for uh, for argument's sake, Big Brother. If people want to to, to get their name out there and to be known, you go on a television programme like that. Well, here's somebody who... Hang on. Here's somebody (laughs) who is being recognised for for being beautiful. And it's not her fault that that she's beautiful. That's just the way that she is. (laughs) It's... It's not her fault, Sally, that she's beautiful. Come on, you can't argue with that. Of course it's not her fault that she's beautiful, but that's a completely ridiculous argument. If somebody goes on Big Brother and they behave in a way that I wouldn't behave myself, that doesn't affect the way the world views me and my gender. If a society supports beauty contests, these huge public events, and broadcasts them on telly, then that affects how people see me as a woman and other women. You can't compare them at all. It's a ludicrous point. But, but she's not a size zero. We're not talking about somebody here who would be a bad influence on children. Children yeah, looking I, up to Miss England wouldn't look at her her and their parents be horrified. They, they wouldn't, would they? Well, I resent the implication that a woman who's very thin is a bad influence on children. I think that in itself is offensive. It doesn't make any difference whatsoever what size somebody in a beauty contest is. And also, they're a size 8 anyway, so I think you're kind of, I think you're assuming that there are more, um, th- there are more tolerant sort of criteria involved in beauty pageants. They are really, really slim girls still. But nonetheless, that's not the point what shape they are. The point is that we're judging women solely on how they look and grading them accordingly and doing that in the name of entertainment. It's grotesque. Sally Hughes, I appreciate your time this morning. She's a beauty editor with The Guardian newspaper and Justin Dealey. Um, I'm sorry. I, I mean, Justin put up a good fight until the... It's not her fault she's beautiful, is it? And they kind of lost it then. Justin, thank you very much indeed. Well, what do you think? You've heard the argument. Are beauty pageants demeaning to women... Or are they just a bit of harmless fun? Remember in the 70s and the 80s, there were always beauty pageants. You'd have them at local carnivals. Don't bite your nails. You'd have them at local carnivals. You would, uh, they would be on TV. Everywhere was a beauty pageant. Now you don't see them so much, which I kind of think is a good thing. 08459 455 555. What do you think? Beauty pageants, are they demeaning to women? Or, as Dealey says, it's just a bit of harmless fun, for goodness sake. It's not their fault they're so beautiful. <laughs> Travel news for beds, cards and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. M1 southbound. We've still got a lane closed. An accident with two lorries and a car involved between Junction 13 at Bedford and 12 at Flittick. Traffic's queuing around there. It's looking pretty busy. As you continue down the M1, it's also slow from Junction 11 at the A505 down toward 9 at Redbourne. There was an accident through there earlier this morning, so it could just be a bit of residual traffic from that, plus a generally slow morning. Anti-clockwise M25 stop start from the M11 to the A10. As you continue, it's busy from the M1 to Junction 19 at Watford. And there are also delays between Maple Cross at Junction 17 and the M40 at Junction 16, while queues are building all the time in toward London on the A1 through Boreham Wood, from Stirling Corner to Mill Hill Circus. As for the trains and tubes, we haven't got any problems reported. Adam Glynn, BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you very much, Adam. 08459 455 555. Let's talk about beauty pageants. Miss World, is it demeaning? 7.30, news and sport, Catherine Boyle. Across beds, hearts and bugs. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. Good 
Good morning. It's 7.30. The headlines. Russia's President Vladimir Putin's under pressure from other G8 leaders at their summit in Northern Ireland to agree a joint statement on Syria or face isolation. The army is sending out redundancy notices of 5,000 people in the latest stage of a huge restructuring programme brought about by big cuts to the defence budget. And Aylesbury Vale District Council is set to decide whether to pour more public money into the legal fight against government plans to build a high-speed rail link through the Chilterns. Three Counties Sports. BBC Three Counties Radio. There's confusion this morning as to Joe Kinnear's position at Newcastle United. The one-time Luton boss claims he signed a contract to take on the role as the club's director of football, but so far Newcastle haven't commented. And last night Kinnear gave a radio interview criticising the media and underlining his credentials for the job. Wickham Wanderers manager Gareth Ainsworth says he expects to bring in some new faces over the summer. You're in the region of sort of three or four if we can um, to add to this and, uh, and we'll see, but there's parameters on that of, of how much we we uh, we pay players and if we get players cheaper we can sign more if we if we sign big names you, you know it, it takes a bit chunk of the budget up and we can only sign a few then so there's all sorts of things going on but I've got a lot of bases covered in Rugby Union, the British and Irish Lions play the Brumbies in Canberra at 10.30 this morning, UK time. The Lions captain for the match is Rory Best and he says maintaining their unbeaten record on tour with a good performance could lead to some players being selected for Saturday's first test against Australia. There's a bit of pressure on there, you know, we've, we've obviously performed very well so far and that's, I suppose, just another another thing to contend with. You know, ultimately we're going out to play for the Lions to produce a performance and you know, we feel if we can produce a performance the result will follow and there will potentially be other things for boys that are playing on Tuesday that will follow at the weekend. And Flat Racing's Royal Ascot gets underway today. A minute's silence will be held to honour one of its favourite sons, the trainer Sir Henry Cecil, who died last week. And that's the latest news and sport. More from me at 8 o'clock. Call 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. Yep, that's it. That's the phone number. Beauty pageants. Um, I can't remember any of the other things we're talking about. There's plenty of stuff coming up. And let me guarantee you, it, at the very least, it's bronze. Some of it is silver. I would say one of these things coming up is, is almost gold as well. Certainly a B+. Plus. Oh, well, no, I listen, you've got to be honest. These people can sniff out uh, nonsense uh, uh, at 50 metres. So uh, you've got to be completely honest. Some of your texts on uh, Miss World and beauty pageants. 81333. Start your text, 3CR. Beauty, says Anne in Luton, seems to be, if you look like those awful, thin, straight-faced models, you're beautiful. Why on earth don't they smile? And Paul G says, uh, perhaps we should find the... Uh, oh, the, the, sorry. What? Oh, I got a second. Yes. Perhaps we should find the gangs that round up the, woman, the women who force them to enter the Miss World competitions. Oh, no, wait. No one is actually forcing them to do it. For goodness sakes, it's just fun. It's just fun. But we have better ways of getting fun, don't we, Paul? It, does, it just seems a little bit old-fashioned, a little bit dated. I, I, looking at women parading around in their swimsuits, sweat, wearing sashes and telling us how they want to help sick children. Do give me a call. I'm keen to hear your, your thoughts on this. Oh, they don't have swimsuits anymore. Oh, in Indonesia, of course they don't. No, you're right. Yes, you're right, you're right, you're right. Uh, do give us a call on this. I'm keen to have your thoughts on uh, uh, beauty pageants, uh, Miss World, and also get kids entering beauty pageants as well. We'll talk about that in a few minutes' time. 08459 455 555. A hospital in Buckinghamshire has reopened just months after it shut, leaving some of its staff without wages for a few months. The privately run Royal Buckinghamshire Hospital will now, under new management, offer a wide range of spinal and neurological services. Well, Steve Bell is the Secretary of the Health Branch of Unison for Buckinghamshire. Uh, Steve, do you welcome the fact this hospital has reopened? Yes, thanks, Ian, for the opportunity to speak. I think... uh in this time of austerity, uh, any new jobs that are created in the healthcare industry are welcome, yes. We understand that all of the staff uh, previously who, who hadn't received their money have now got their wages. Are, are you concerned that something like that could happen again? Yeah, everyone has received their wages. And I think we are concerned that lessons have been learned. So we have tried to approach the new employer to sort of arrange to meet with them to discuss the previous circumstances and see what lessons we, that can be learned from it. How long did it take for the staff to get paid? Uh, pro- well, there was a campaign going, well, running with, alongside uh, Unison for about six months. Oh. So overall, you know, workers were without wages for up to at least three months. 
Uh, and the staff that lost their jobs, are they going back to the hospital to work or are the, the hospital taking on new staff? Well, my understanding is, is that uh, they are looking to re-employ yeah, many of the staff and, uh, that were working there previously, and that's welcome. Uh, but some of the staff, because of their circumstances and the things that they went through, do not want to return. Mm. Oh, yeah, I bet they, they don't. Mm. Uh, and the hospital is to offer more services than it did previously. Uh, did you, will it give people in Buckinghamshire more options? Um. Well, I, I, I'm not sure, because the services in Buckinghamshire are generally very good, so I'm not sure how many people in Buckinghamshire will actually use uh, the I know the, the NHS um, is a good service in Buckinghamshire, though it can be improved. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm unclear as to who uh, the services will be provided for, but my understanding is, is that there will be, again, uh, contracts with overseas um agencies. Steve, thank you very much. Steve Bell, Secretary of the Health Branch of Unison for Buckinghamshire. Call 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. I don't care what you say, I'm looking at the front pages of these newspapers, yeah? Yeah, you with me on this one, guys? There's a half-eaten Mars bar in the way. That could uh, could make things a little bit messy, but we'll, we'll, we'll stagger through it, shall we? Let's have a look. What have we got? The front page of The Telegraph. Sarchi cautioned for assault. Charles Sarchi accepted a caution for assault yesterday after he was photographed with his hands around the throat of his wife, Nigella Lawson. He claimed... <clears throat> They were having a playful tiff. Oh, yeah! When me and my wife have playful tiffs... In fact, I don't even know what a playful tiff is. We have arguments, or we're playful. Playful tiff? But I'm constantly putting my hands around her throat and tweaking her nose. Yeah! It just makes the tiff a little bit more playful, I find. Going off on a tangent and not to demean the story at all, am I the only person that that thinks Charles Saatchi looks pretty darn good for, for 70 years of age? I think he looks for 70... I remember when I was a kid, 70-year-olds... Well, you didn't see 70-year-olds. No one lived to 70 when I was a kid. Uh, And if the old... People in their 50s looked old. People in their 50s would sit in the corner on an old chair wearing a cloth cap and smoking a pipe. Anyway, I'm just going to go off slightly. Uh, Less to eat, but sedentary lives gain us extra two stone. Britons are consuming 600 fewer calories a day, but are growing fatter because of sedentary jobs and a lack of exercise. A respected think tank has found... Not not one of those rubbish think tanks that people have completely disrespect and are always dissing in the street. This is a respected one. On average, adults weigh up to two stone, two pounds, or 14 kilograms more than people of the same age 30 years ago, despite a 20% drop in daily calorie intake. Hey, there's a health and safety story on the front page of The Telegraph. No ball. Health and safety rules stump cricketers. Stump. They put the word stump in because it can mean confuse. It also is a thing that you use in cricket. A cricket team has been forced out of the village uh, where it has played for generations after the council banned players from practising with real balls over health and safety fears. Backton Cricket Club, which has played in the Norfolk village since 1934, was ordered to stop using real balls despite no one having been hurt. The parish council said the restrictions were necessary to prevent passers-by being hit and injured by stray balls. The club refused to comply. Those cricketers. Oh, they're so naughty, aren't they? Uh, And has now been banned from the playing field altogether, despite a petition from local residents. Can I make a suggestion? We ban cricket everywhere. It's a horrible... No, any sport that takes more than a day to play a sport where you have to we have to stop now guys why Who, have we won no it's lunchtime sorry we're stopping sport for lunch and i don't know if you've ever caught a cricket ball i caught one once at school it hurts i caught a cricket ball once at school never again let's just get rid of cricket there are very few sports i'd keep i'd keep dennis you agree with me don't you get rid of cricket um, yes. You do agree it's with me, don't you? game. Well, it's ridiculous. Have you ever caught a cricket ball? No. It flipping hurts. I know. I caught one on the front of my leg, actually. Yeah, there we go. You see, it hurts. it's made of hard leather. Imagine being hit by something made of hard leather. Oh, imagine it for a second, Dunstable. We did, at school. Yeah. Oh, hello. Got hit by a piece of hard leather. 
Yes. On well, a very tender part. Yes, I did at the weekend and it cost me a fortune. Right, no, I didn't. That's a joke. Right, uh, let's have a quick look at some of the pages, uh, front pages, shall we, Dennis? Yes. OK. Um, time is running out for Syria peace deal, Cameron tells Jet. Now, this is the story, Dennis, that unless Putin gets in line with everyone else at the G8, Russia's going to be left out in the cold. Oh, dear, they've been out in the cold for years. What might, they won't make a blind bit of difference. It's a very cold country. That's right, and they're used to it. Uh, no, I, I honestly, I think he's, he's, he's punching above his weight here. Cameron? Tell, yeah, he's... tell him, tell him, put Putin. He'd laugh all the way to the bank. The only thing they can do with Syria is let them fight it out. Yes. We're wasting that. Whichever side you go for, they're going to hate you later. The other side's going to hate you later on. Yep. We're poking our nose into places. Nothing to do with us. What's that noise in the background? Me, this. My squeaky office chair. Sorry. You sure it's your chair? Yes. I'm, I'm uh, OK. Yes, no, it's not. I'm, I'm sorry. getting a Reginald Perrin moment here. Yes, no. OK, yes. right. Um, diabetes risk in red meat. Do you eat burgers and red meat, Dennis? I don't eat burgers because I don't know what part of the animal it's made from. Well, I think we do know. Lips and backsides. That's Lips right, and backsides. Yes. Well, it's all beef, you see. They can say it's beef. Yes. What's, what's your beef, Dennis? Uh, I would like a nice steak. There we go, lovely. Proper steak. What have you called in for? I called in about this business with the beauty contest. Yes. It's, it's quite frankly, it is a bit of a game. Um, who, who forces these young ladies to go into it? I don't believe they're forced to go into it. I believe it is they, they choose to That's enter right. it, Miss World. They're, they're trying to show they've got something that other girls haven't got. They yes. might have no brains. I mean, some of the people up there who win these contests, I must admit, they're brainless to start with. But... Never could you please, could you please, Dennis? It's their Dennis, moment of thing. Yeah. Dennis, please stop moving in that chair. It sounds disgusting. Oh, sorry, sorry. It sounds disgusting. I oh, know, but it is, it's not. It's, it's, it's just, I, well, I, I don't, it sounds like you're cutting the cheese, and I really no, don't I, want I, that to be part I, of the show. I the chair. Thank you. Sit very still. No, no, I think that it's these young ladies' chance for the 15 minutes of fame. Yes. And I, and to say, I admire them. I, oh, I bet you do. do. But some of the people, um... Some of these uh, celebrities, you know, thick as three deal planks. But that then, sorry. Stop it. The, um, the countdown that's been taken over by a very beautiful young lady with brains. She's, she's absolutely fabulous at mathematics. Hang on a minute, hang on a minute. Right, the countdown, and the, the Channel 4 programme you're referring to. Yes. Carol Vorderman was very beautiful. That's right. And she had brains. This one's even nicer. No, what you mean, I, I, I know this woman uh, that you're talking about, I don't know her personally, but what you mean by this one's even nicer is, this one wears even shorter dresses. No, yes. I think, no. She, yes, she she's does. A, she's a nice, younger shape to start with. She's a all. younger shape. Oh, Dennis. Dennis. Oh, if I showed you a photograph of me at 20, what? I was gorgeous. I was. Right. Yeah. Blonde, th- blue-eyed. Now... Oh, I fancy you a I bit. I look like my great-grandfather. You are your great-grandfather. No. I'm older than my mum now. Can you believe that? <laughs> yes, but my, my grandchildren can't believe that the photograph I showed them in my Navy uniform was me. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, Dennis, listen, it's, uh, let me read you some of these um, texts. Uh, uh, who's this from? Uh, Keith in Nebworth says, It's only... Oh, dearie me. It's only mingers that don't like Miss World, as a lot of women are jealous over other women. It's not as if they don't have a choice. Well, Keith, the, the guest that we had on earlier on, Sally Hughes, talking uh, about Miss World, I don't want to bring it down to this base level, but I will do. She was certainly not a minger. Uh, and Phil says... Have you gone, Dennis? Yeah, no, no, I'm just listening oh. and trying not to squeak. OK, thank you. And Phil says, Justin was on a hiding to nothing. This was We had a debate between uh, um, uh, Sally Hughes and Justin Dealey about Miss World. Justin was on a hiding to nothing. As being a man in today's society, he has no moral right to comment on anything that involves women, does he? I don't know if that's true, Dennis. We're, no. we're allowing you to comment on stuff, don't we? And you're a gentleman. Well, I am. I mean, for instance, Miss yes. Kelly... On your, on your, um, Kelly Bates, me- member of our she, team, yes. She's got a lovely voice. I, when she comes on, she makes she cheers me up just by listening to her. Well, let's see if she, let's see if she cheers up people now. Kelly Betts, could you say something to see if you can cheer people up? Sorry, what did you say? There we go, you see. I feel miserable now, Dennis. You've, you've got me into a funk. Dennis and Dunstable, thank you very much uh, indeed. 08459 555 is the telephone number. <laughs> 
Travel news for beds, cards and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. The A1, Roxton, Black Cat Roundabout, it's looking slow. We've got queues approaching the roundabout, though they're not tailing back to St Neots quite yet. On the M1 southbound, it looks like all lanes have opened after the accident earlier between Junction 13 at Bedford and 12 at Flittick. Traffic's still there, though. There are delays that start around Milton Keynes at Junction 14, heading down toward Junction 13. Could take you 10 or 15 minutes to get through, and it's still very slow from Luton Airport at Junction 10 down toward the A5 at Junction 9. The A10 delays through Chesant as you come from the Great Cambridge Road down toward Winston Churchill Way. 15 or 20 minutes worth at the moment. M25 anti-clockwise, stop start from the M11 in towards the Enfield turn, the A10 and into the roadwork section. About 20, 25 minutes of delays there. Then it's taking roughly an hour to get from the M1 at Junction 21 to the M4 at Junction 15. Delays on the A41 with queues coming from Watford down to the M25 at Junction 20. Slow into London on the A1 through Boreham Wood. Trains and tubes running well. Adam Glynn, BBC Three Counties Radio. Adam, thank you very much indeed. More from Adam in 15 minutes right now. 7.46. It's Tuesday the 18th of June. I'm Ian Lee. These are your headlines on BBC Three Counties Radio. Russia's President Vladimir Putin is under pressure from other G8 leaders at their summit in Northern Ireland to agree a joint statement on Syria or face isolation. The army is sending out redundancy notices to 5,000 people in the latest stage of a huge restructuring programme brought about by big cuts to the defence budget. In sport, in rugby union, ah, the British and Irish Lions play the Brumbies in Canberra at 10.30 this morning. Hey, hey, we're the Brumbies. Coming up, I'll be talking about kids going online. When is the right age for children to be using the internet? 7.47, here's the weather with Kate. Kate. Beds, hearts and bucks weather. BBC Three Counties Radio. Good morning. Well, it's a rather cloudy start. We've had some brightness through parts of the three counties this morning, but we're slowly starting to see that cloud increase. It's not to say it's wall-to-wall cloud. We will get some brighter spells and some sunny intervals, but along with that, the possibility of some scattered showers. Now, later on this afternoon, they could potentially be quite heavy towards the west, so out towards West Hertfordshire, for example, parts of Buckinghamshire. So watch out for that later. But the temperature is steadily starting to rise. Again, the further west, the warmer it'll be. There is a north northeasterly breeze rather so the further east you are it may be a few degrees cooler but 23 celsius the predicted maximum today that's 73 degrees in fahrenheit overnight we're hanging on to rather a lot of cloud again a muggy night scattered showers particularly early hours of tomorrow morning minimum temperature though a warm 13 celsius 55 degrees in fahrenheit for tomorrow, a similar day, actually. We'll get one or two showers first thing. They'll dry out, leaving some clearer, some sunny spells and some brightness. But the temperature getting steadily warmer. The maximum tomorrow, 25 Celsius, 77 degrees in Fahrenheit. It's all changed, though, for Thursday with some cooler air and some rain arriving. That's your forecast. Every weekday morning, questions are asked. What should the government do next to stop people smoking? Who do you blame for our failing high streets? Opinions are formed. There is no place in a civilised society for people like that. They should get real. Part of me says it is wrong. And you get to have your say. I think the whole thing is absolute garbage, frankly. Join in with the big phone-in from Nine. Not everyone will agree. What an interesting conversation. The JVS Show, weekday mornings from Nine on BBC Three Counties Radio. Internet firms are being summoned to Downing Street. You try saying that with a mouthful of chocolate. Amid calls for more to be done to block images of child sex abuse and to stop children viewing pornography. Well, David Cameron thinks more can be done to remove illegal material from the web and steer children away from harmful adult content. The talks at number 10 will be hosted by the Culture Secretary, Maria Miller. The reason behind today's summit is very much to change the game of um, the way the internet is being run at the moment and making sure that we have more in place to have uh, robust um, actions being taken against illegal images. Well, is it fair to expect these companies to shoulder the responsibility? They're not sat behind the kids watching what they're looking at. Doesn't the control lie in the hands of the parents? Well, Justin Dealey has been asking you about this. When is the right age for children to be on? Online. I would say about nine-ish. Not like Facebook or anything, just like Nickelodeon, like the kids' sites for games and stuff like that, but not definitely not Facebook, nothing like that. I wouldn't even let them on that at 12, 13. The age of 16. 16, really? Can you tell us why? 
because you don't know who they're talking to. You've got your lovely child with you today. Is the, the thought of, of your child going on the internet at some point in the future, does that terrify you, yeah. it, just thinking about it? Yeah, it does. Yeah, of all the stories that's gone on that we hear on the news, um, but every year it's getting worse and worse. So she's like one and ten years or 12, 13 years. It could be awful. Like, you have no control over it. My seven-year-old, who's nearly eight, he does have a Facebook, but I do watch it. It's just, like, family on it, and he can't accept or anything to anyone. I'll only accept his requests, and it's obviously it's family members and things like that. As long as you watch it and you keep an eye on him, I think, yeah. Well, Kate Russell is a technology journalist from Harpenden and author of Working the Cloud. Uh, Kate, why... Surely t- stopping child pornography online is quite easy, isn't it? You can't Google just, as soon as they find it, get rid of it. Well, the problem is, yes, of course they can. As soon as they find it, they can get rid of it. But unfortunately, the internet is now such a just a massive, massive proposition. There are over 17 billion indexed pages. Um, 170,000 new websites are put up every day. Over 300,000 images are loaded up daily just to Facebook alone. Um, and Google handled 1.2 trillion search inquiries in 2012. So the problem is it's the scale of the internet that makes it something which is really difficult difficult to police on a very minute scale like that. Um, But let's be clear, you know, the Google and all of the other major internet companies are already doing an awful lot and doing a very good job. CEOP, the Child Online Exploitation and Protection Centre themselves, uh, they reported record numbers of children protected last year. Um, in 2012-2013, an increase of 85% on the previous year. So, you know, it's it's not that people are sitting around with their uh, hands underneath their bottoms, so to speak. Um, And I think it's actually dangerous rhetoric that the politicians are jumping on the bandwagon of everybody's sensibilities um, and you know dare I say it I do, do do suspect that it's somewhat convenient that all this talk about internet companies being responsible for child exportation images it's kind of deflecting the attention away from GCHQ and the NSA's prison activities recently isn't it oh I see very clever a little bit because of course we spied on everybody in, in, in G8 four years ago it turns out so yes it could be uh, a way of doing exactly. that. Putting the child pornography to one side, is, which is probably best to do for a second. Uh, in terms of other people, other children accessing pornography on the internet, mm-hmm. isn't, the, isn't the obvious thing to do what they did in Iceland and make it an opt-in system where you have to speak to your ISP and say, yes, I would like to be able to access pornography? Well, this is it. I mean, one of the problems that there is is that that was one of the arguments that's going around is should the uh, search companies institute more heavy handed censorship on searches so that you do have to go through an application process to uh, to access any kind of uh, pornography or adult material. Um, and the thing is, the thing about that is there are obviously privacy issues here in that people who perhaps want to be able to access perfectly legal uh, but somewhat uh, spurious material um, they don't want to have to go through that process of being feeling like the, the the system is monitoring them tough well listen if you want to get a mucky and I, don't ask me how i know this if you want to get a mucky um, channel activated on your sky package quite often you have to phone them up and tell them that you'd like it that's that's a small price to pay a little bit of uh, indignity if, if that's what you want well, yes, and, and to be honest with you, this would be a route to go if it were a catch-all route, but unfortunately, you cannot stop people who want to do uh, illegal things from doing illegal things, and they're going to find other ways. The people who are putting up illegal pornography and child abuse images, they're not putting that stuff up, you know, under legal barriers. They're not, you know, trying to sort of put it out there as, as anything that's legal. They're doing it in very sneaky ways and the more you clamp down on legal activity then the more um underhand and undercover the illegal activity will go which will make it even harder to um you know perhaps even monitor and find out when people have been viewing it whose responsibility do you think it is to protect our kids from naughty images is it facebook and google or is it the parents It's the parents' responsibility to look after their children. You know, we're getting into a point where we're looking at the the schools to teach sex education and the government to protect this, that and the other. Uh, The parents have a responsibility of care to their children until they're old enough to look after themselves. They wouldn't let them go out and cross the street on their own, uh, you know, in front of the cars. And they don't expect the DVLC 
to stop cars from driving down their street because their children might want to cross the road. What they do is they go out with their children and they teach them how to cross the road safely. They teach them what is and isn't right, what to look out for, and they do it with them until such time as they're confident their children will be safe on their own. This is how we need to view the internet. Uh, And finally, what age do you think we should let kids go on the internet? I think uh, uh, sit beside your child from the age of two and three and explore the internet together. If you're asking me when a child should be uh, allowed on their own on the internet unsupervised, then I would say that really that should be judged on a case-by-case basis because all children mature differently but i think it's every parent's duty to enjoy the internet with their children and when they feel that their child is is old enough and mature enough to make the right choices for themselves that is the time and you know and that could be 13 14 18 whatever it depends on your child kate russell thank you very much indeed technology german uh, journalist and author of uh, working the cloud i nearly said germanist I don't think she's a Germanist. We haven't got time to investigate that just that. Uh, uh, on the subject of Miss World, Shirley's in Milton Keynes. Good morning, Shirley. Good morning, Ian. What's your take on Miss World? Well, I've got nothing against Miss World, but I think we've got to remember beauty is only skin deep. We can have the most beautiful girl in the world. Well, she could be a right she there. She can be as thick as whatnot. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know, and yet you can have somebody who's, who's not as as beautiful Ugly. as Miss World, but can be Clever. so so intelligent. Yeah, it's often and the think, way it works. Well, it, I think this is what we've got to remember. Beauty is only skin deep. As a woman, Shirley, yes. uh, are you offended by the thought that these women from all around the world will gather together and be ranked in order of beauty? Well, I can't say I'm offended. I mean, I used to watch it many, many years ago when it was on television. I, I, mean, I, I can't remember the last time I ever watched Miss World, and I, I don't take any interest in it anymore. Um, but, I mean... We've come... It's 2013, Shirley. It is. We've come a long way. We have. I, I agree with you there, Ian. Yeah, we have come a long way. Um, but, like I say, you know, you can have... She can be the most beautiful girl in the world and yet know nothing. Really. Yeah. But I don't believe in children's passions, so I think they are disgraceful. Well, we're going to be talking about this in a little bit. Mm. At what age do you think it is acceptable for, for young people to enter these beauty pageants? Oh, probably not till they're about 20, I would think. Wow. Yeah, I really don't believe in children's pageants, so I think, I think they're an absolute disgrace. And I think a lot of that is due, is parents pushing, is pushy parents. And you're not. Like you're right. Parents. You're not. I would be very surprised if a six-year-old spontaneously came downstairs one day and said, "Mama, I want to go in a beauty pageant." It has oh. to come from the parents, doesn't of it? Of course it does. Of course it does. You, there is so many pushy parents out there in in that sort of thing, you know. Um, but I think when I've seen the way they dress, especially. A lot of it has come from America, Isn't hasn't it? it? Yes. Yeah. And when I've seen on television these little girls, little, you know, in America, and their parents are so pushy and they dress them up and all this makeup. It's like little, little dolls. It's, it's dreadful. Sh- I think it's absolutely dreadful. Shirley, thank you very much indeed. We'll be talking about younger beauty pageants in a bit. 08459 four double five five double five. Travel news for beds, cards and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. The A1, Roxton, coming toward the Black Cat roundabout on the southbound side. You've got queuing traffic. We've had a call coming from Esther about the A6. The junction with the A421, there's a car broken down very near there. Not sure which road it's on exactly, but if anyone else is caught up in the traffic, do give us a call. 08459 455 555. A1M southbound, that's slow moving from Hitchin down towards Stevenage. There are still delays on the M1 after the accident earlier this morning. They're all cleared, but the traffic's still there. Milton Keynes down toward Bedford, junction 14 to 13, Luton Airport to Redbourne Junction 10 to 9, M25 traffic anti-clockwise is slow from the M11 to the 810 and then busy through the roadwork section before slowing right down from the M1 to the M4 and it's taking you about an hour to navigate that stretch. A10 through Chesant is looking busy toward the Winston Churchill Way, the A41 in Watford is queuing at Kings Langley and it's still quite slow on the A5 in Dunstable. Trains and tubes looking good. Adam Glynn, BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you Adam. Beauty pageants, really? Do we need them in 2013? We'll start talking as well about kids in beauty pageants. There's no excuse for that behaviour. Or is there? Here's Catherine Boyle. 
on FM, AM, online and digital radio. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. Good morning, it's 8 o'clock. The headlines, Russia warned not to stand alone on Syria, Saatchi caution for Nigella assault and plans to boost EasyJet's fleet. BBC Three Counties Radio. Leaders at the G8 summit in Enniskillen have been trying to bridge their differences on how to respond to the conflict in Syria. Moscow has been warned that it risks isolation unless it agrees to a joint statement on how to deal with President Assad's regime. The art collector Charles Saatchi has admitted assaulting his wife, Nigella Lawson, during an argument outside a London restaurant. Scotland Yard says a 70-year-old man went voluntarily to a central London police station yesterday and accepted a caution for assault. Lisa Hampley reports. Charles Saatchi, who's 70, had claimed that images which showed his hands on his wife's throat were part of a playful tiff during an intense debate about her children. The photographs, published first in a tabloid newspaper, were taken as the couple were sitting outside a restaurant in Mayfair in London. In a statement last night, the Metropolitan Police said officers from Westminster's Community Safety Unit had been aware of the article and had carried out an investigation. The statement said a 70-year-old man voluntarily attended a central London police station yesterday afternoon and accepted a caution for assault. Police are looking for two teenagers who attacked a 15-year-old boy as he walked through the Marsh Farm estate on his way home from school last week. The victim was hit with a plank of wood wrapped in barbed wire as he walked home on Friday afternoon. Gail Sanderson has the details. Detectives are keen to speak to anyone who saw what happened in Henge Way at 3.45 or know the identity of the offenders who ran off towards Sundon Park. The boy carrying the weapon was black, around 15 years old, with short hair and wearing a blue jumper. The other was around the same age of light-skinned Asian appearance and wearing a black short-sleeved shirt. He was riding a red BMX bike. The privately run Royal Buckinghamshire Hospital has reopened under new ownership. A number of staff complained they'd not been paid in full by the previous administration, which led to scathing public criticism from the Buckingham MP and House of Commons Speaker John Burko. The situation has now been resolved and the hospital's new chairman, Chris Bialan, is looking to open a new chapter. I think the problem the previous owners had is they relied too much on the overseas market and not on the local markets. So we're, we've got uh, units in three different counties in Hampshire, Dawson and Surrey. So we're bringing the skills we've developed in those areas into Aylesbury. So we're very much focused more on the local market and the national market rather than just the overseas market. Luton-based firm EasyJet has announced plans to expand its fleet with 135 new aircraft. The airline's placed an order for 35 current generation A320s and 100 new generation A320 Neos for delivery between 2015 and 2022. EasyJet's also agreed rights to buy up a further 100 A320 Neos at some time in the future. Sport now and in rugby union, the British and Irish Lions play their final warm-up match ahead of Saturday's first test against Australia this morning. They'll take on the Brumbies at Canberra at 10.30 our time. The weather, cloudy with sunny spells, scattered showers and a top temperature of 23 degrees Celsius, that's 73 Fahrenheit. Get the latest news and sports online at bbc.co.uk slash three counties. Thank you, Catherine. A little muttering to myself there, why not? We all do it. This is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. It's three minutes past eight. It's Tuesday. Wowzers. Here every weekday morning between six and nine o'clock. Lots coming up now, including the fight against plans to build the high-speed rail link through Buckinghamshire could cost Aylesbury Vale District Council a quarter of a million pounds. Is it a good use of taxpayers' money? The Miss World competition is gearing up. Miss England comes from Bishop Stortford. But 2013, are beauty pageants demeaning to wit women? And Stuart Hall has been sentenced to 15 months in prison. We're we talking more about that and asking, is that really a suitable punishment? Facebook.com forward slash BBC 3CR. You can send me a text, 81333, start your text 3CR. Or you can give me a call. 08459 455 555 Across beds, hearts and bucks This is BBC Three Counties Radio 
cost of Aylesbury Vale District Council fighting the high-speed rail link HS2 could reach more than a quarter of a million pounds if councillors approve an increased spending plan. To date, the councillors spent £150,000 challenging the scheme, but in July they'll decide on whether to spend a further £100,000. Earlier on on this show, Councillor David Thompson from Aylesbury Vale District told me why it was important they kept up the fight against HS2. He said spending all this money is justified. I see this as an insurance policy. You take out insurance for when something happens that is going to be catastrophic or whatever it might be to the family or yourself. This is exactly the same. I see this as an investment that we actually are spending this money to ensure that we mitigate should this line go forward. I think it's quite a sensible thing to do. We have to try and do what's best for our residents so that we, we <coughs> excuse me, that we have to, so we achieve the, long, the best long-term benefit for our communities and the local environment. Tom Crane is a Buckinghamshire resident and from the group HS2 Action Alliance who are campaigning against the high-speed rail li- uh, line. Tom, local residents are in a bit of a dilemma, aren't they? The council say they need to spend the money, but there's no guarantee it's going to have any effect. Uh, Morning, Ian. No, there's no guarantee. You're quite right. But uh, I think it really is an insurance policy. I mean, if HS2 proceeds, um, it's a settled fact that the impact on Aylesbury in particular will be extremely negative, um, and it will be permanently negative. Um, And what the court case has exposed is that there really is no reason for HS2 to proceed. It doesn't make sense as a transport project or an economic project. So it's, it's vital that we continue this fight and really um, push the government to think again. Is it not a fool's errand, Tom? They're not going to cancel HS2, are they? I I think they will. You know, I I mean, there's a great article... Do you really think that? I think there's a a great chance. I mean, no-one knows the future, obviously, and it would be a fool to kind of come on your show and say, this will happen or that will happen for sure. But the fact of the matter is, if you go back to 29, 2010, they would never have thought in a million years that the level of opposition this thing is creating up and down the country, not just in Buckinghamshire, Warwickshire, Northamptonshire, and much further north as well. They just wouldn't have expected it. And the uh, justifications for the line have got weaker and weaker. So I think the court cases are a vital part of making that case. You say, uh, Tom, I think that if HS2 is built, the costs will be much greater. What do you mean by that? Um, I think the costs have been, have been, have been under, um, underplayed to date. And um, I don't say that because we just think that. If you look at the recent example of Euston, where HS2 had to suddenly announce that all their plans for Euston had to be radically scaled back because they were 30 to 40% over budget. Uh, and you also have the Cabinet Office's major projects authority, again, a, another arm of government, saying that uh, HS2 is amber red at the minute, which means its budget status uh, isn't, is not in a happy place. The council can't keep throwing vast sums of money at this. There has to be a point, doesn't there, where they they draw the line. Otherwise, taxpayers are going to be out of pocket. Um, I would would wonder if it's really vast sums of money. I mean, obviously, it's a huge... Quarter of a million pounds. It's a million pounds, but it's shared between lots of different councils. What the councils have done really well is is come together up and down the country to oppose this. So it's not just one council. We obviously hear a lot locally about Aylesbury and Bucks, but it's Hillingdon, it's Warwickshire... And there's many others as well. So I think um, the overall costs are split between... But, but the quarter of a million pounds would, is from Aylesbury, isn't it? Yes, it, yes it is. So the, it, it is a significant amount of money. I know compared to the, 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 the money that it's going to cost to build HS2, it's, it's a drop in the ocean. But, that, I mean, that, that money could be spent on, on potholes, on saving bu- bus routes, on doing all kinds of things for the local community. No, you're right, Ian. And it's a, it's a, it's a sum of money which we have to think about carefully. But I think... Uh, the question we have to ask ourselves is what would Aylesbury be like and what would Buckinghamshire be like if HS2 gets built? And I think all the objective sources say that our community would be in a far, far worse position forever. And I think we wouldn't really forgive ourselves if we had the chance to stop it or mitigate it and we didn't take it. And this is what this case is all about. Tom, what's the next move for the HS2 Action Alliance? Well, we've got a, there's a paving bill um, next week, next Wednesday, um, where the government are bringing HS2 onto the floor of the House of Commons. Our campaigning team have been on the ground in Westminster this week and they'll be back next week. Um, We are meeting with loads of MPs, particularly off-route MPs, and we hope for some kind of rebellion, hopefully. Um, We don't think um, the government will lose the the vote, but we think we'll have a nice uh, number of MPs that are showing their opposition to the plans. Tom uh, uh, Crane, Buckinghamshire resident and uh, from HS2 Action Alliance, thank you very much. Call 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio asking this morning uh, about Miss World and beauty pageants in general. Are they a bit dated? 
they're, they're a little bit old-fashioned. The 70s, you couldn't move for beauty pageants. They were everywhere. And, hey, look, look what happened to the 70s. The 70s have been arrested, the 80s have been taking in for cautioning, and the 90s have had a strong word with. Lots of you have been saying this on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash BBC 3CR. Uh, you've been giving your comments on uh, beauty pageants. Um, Anne-Marie uh, Gladding says, It's not just Miss World, it's the whole culture of judging women purely on looks alone. As if all we're worth is a pretty face. Men aren't judged like this. It makes us feel as if we aren't attractive. It makes us feel that if we aren't attractive, we aren't worth anything. Um... Drake, is, uh, Drake, I, I th- think his point implies that he thinks we could be talking about more serious things. You know there are children in this country who are only eating one meal a day. I do know that, Drake, and um, I'm happy to discuss that if you have any local stories about that. Please do get in touch, ian.lee at bbc.co.uk. Otherwise, just because there are children only eating one meal a day and there are people suffering around the world, doesn't mean we can't talk about this. Silly sausage. There's a picture of um, Justin Dealey and I actually having a fight on the Facebook page, and Carolyn has uh, suggested that Justin is maybe uh, pouting a little bit too much. Um, Tricia says she should be able to enter beauty pageants. If you don't like them, don't interfere with them. There's some cracking footage on YouTube. Type in Bob Hope Miss World. Oh, it's cracking. I'm guessing 1978? That, that's kind of what it looks like to me. Uh, and Bob Hope is hosting Miss World and some feminists invade the stage and it all kicks off. And then Bob makes some kind of vaguely, slightly sexist remark at the end. Um, oh, and Steve, you're very naughty, Steve, on Facebook. Without beauty pageants, how would our wives know what they should be aspiring to look like? Uh, mm, yes. 08459 four double five five double five is the telephone number if you want to give us a call. We'll be talking about Stuart Hall a little bit later on. It's on the front page of a lot of the newspapers, uh, including the Daily Mail. An insult to all his victims. This is Stuart Hall, the It's a Knockout guy. Who we all used to love him, didn't we? The Belgians are coming. We used to love him. And then it turned out he was a paedophile. Oh, now we don't love him so much. Sex predator Hall will serve just two weeks in jail for every one of the 13 girls he attacked. Stuart Hall will serve barely two weeks in prison for each of the young girls he sexually abused. The sentence prompted a wave of outrage and fury last night, with victims saying it made a mockery of their horrific ordeal and politicians and campaigners condemning it as incredibly lenient. I think the reason is uh, because you are sentenced on when the crimes happened. So that's why they were slightly lower sentences back then. I think it could still be a little bit tougher. Uh, the, dis- uh, the disgraced It's a Knockout presenter, 83, was jailed for 15 months yef- yesterday after admitting that he indecently insulted 13 girls between 1967 and 1986. His youngest victim was nine. It does seem incredible. And he's, you know... There we go, here's some of his victims. Girl 10, he told, cuddle me like your teddy. A 10-year-old was assaulted after she met Hall on a family holiday in Madeira in 1982. Teenager fondled by octopus hall in Bath. 13-year-old was attacked in 1976. 15 months. It doesn't seem long enough, does it? 08459 455 555 is the telephone number if you want to have your say on that. The other front page story on the mail. £13,500 to watch the Wimbledon men's final. What? I flippin' hate Wimbledon. It's so boring. What it means is two weeks of rubbish te- uh, TV and my TV watching all over the place. Don't watch much TV anymore, but I still have the, the memories of summers being ruined because of Wimbledon. Tennis fans are being asked to part with as much as £13,500 for the chance to see home favourite Andy Murray win Wimbledon. Oh, really? Go and buy two cars. Go and buy three cars. Ticket prices to next month's showpiece match have soared after the British number one's win at the Queen's Club on Sunday, with loyal followers willing to gamble that the talented Scott will reach the final. You mean he's not English? Wowzers. He's not? According to ticket trading website via GoGo, asking prices for prime centre court seats for the men's final on July the 7th have reached £13,500 for a pet. Oh, you get two tickets for that. Oh, well, that's OK, then. I... So, 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 oh, so that's six... And, OK, right, sorry, I thought it was uh, £13,500 for one ticket. That's ridiculous! Watch it on the telly. I've been to Wimbledon. You can't see anything. You can't see anything. I mean, and the atmosphere... You go and sit on... Was it... What do they call it? Murray Mount. 
Her, 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 Herman Hill. Herman Hill. Henman Hill. Oh, oh, look, we're we're in Wimbledon and we're we're paying seven quid for seven strawberries. Viagogo spokesman Steve Roast said, "Steve Roast, getting involved in what could be a sporting history is a must. It's extraordinary to see how much his win at Queens at the weekend has impacted on ticket demand. Oh, for goodness sakes, people with too much money should not be allowed to spend it. They should be forced to give it to me." Travel news for beds, hearts and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. Now we've still got these reports of a broken down car on the A421 at the junction with the A6 in Bedford. Esther called us about that one. Any other updates come in, that would be very, very useful. 08459 455 555. Traffic does seem to be all right in the area at the moment. The M1, that's still very slow southbound. Newport Pagnell down toward Milton Keynes at Junction 14. And busy again from Luton Airport to Redbourne, Junction 10 to 9. Anti-clockwise, the M25 looking slow from the M11 into the roadworks section. 20, 25 minute delays. And as you continue around anti-clockwise, about an hour of traffic from Junction 21 at the M1, around to 15 at the M4. You've got patches of slow-moving traffic on the A1, first off at the Black Cat roundabout coming southbound from St Neots, then on the A1M from Hitchin to Stevenage, and on the A1 into London through Boreham Wood from Stirling Corner to Mill Hill Circus. Delays as well on the A41 in Aylesbury from the SO roundabout to Broughton Lane, and the A41 in Watford down toward the M25 at Kings Langley. Trains and tubes are still looking good. Adam Glynn, BBC Three Counties Radio. Adam... Yes, Ian. You're still looking good as well. Thank you very much. 8.16, it's Tuesday the 18th of June. I'm Ian Lee. These are your headlines on BBC Three Counties Radio. Leaders at the G8 summit in Enniskillen have been trying to bridge their differences on how to respond to the conflict in Syria. The art collector Charles Saatchi has admitted assaulting his wife Nigella Lawson during an argument outside a London restaurant. In sport, the British and Irish Lions play their final warm-up match ahead of Saturday's first test against Australia at 10.30 this morning. Coming up, I'll be talking to Angela Murray. She lost the use of her legs when she was hit by a car. She's asking the government to continue funding social care and her petition has received more than 45,000 signatures. BBC Three Counties Radio. Every weekday from three, Roberto Peroni. The bosses of a Milton Keynes lorry driver who died after falling asleep at the wheel have been found guilty of manslaughter with the best local news stories. At the moment, Christmas in Luton is at risk. We'll do our best. We'll work with the, the business community and other sponsors to fund the Christmas lights. The best local travel. Multi-vehicle crash on the M1 northbound just as you come from the M25. It's going to get busy. Three cars involved with the best local talking points. Because I was born female, that was my first sin if you like and I don't think I've ever been forgiven for it. Roberto Peroni weekdays from three on BBC Three Counties Radio Hey! Hey, you are, listen, I'm, uh, do you want me to talk for a bit? Because you're puffing, you're huffing. I'm a little out of breath. I saw, as I was doing the news, I saw you rushing past that window. Yes. Into the studio next door, where no doubt you um, rollocked my team, rightfully so. You're t- no, I what? wouldn't rollock your team, they're oh. lovely. In fact, they helped me out. If it hadn't been for your team Sorry? printing my, my paper, I wouldn't be here now. Well, you have permission to rollock them any time you want. Oh. You do, you do. You have, you, you, you do. You have, a, you have a, a hall pass, I believe it's called. Oh, right. A hall pass to, to rock them whenever you want. Right. Yeah, I just think... You, just for anything. Why not? Oh, OK. You, we're the talent. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you forget it, girls. There we go. Look at that. Not even paying attention. <laughs> Not even paying attention. <laughs> Unbelievable. How rude. How rude. Uh, anyway, it's lovely to see you. Looking very, very smart as always. Thanks very much. It's going to be a summery day today. Is it? I've got no idea what the weather's like. Yes, it's looking rather nice out oh. there. A little toasty. Yay. I think it might be a day for you going home and uh, going. sunbathing your lallies. <laughs> what are lallies? My... Your legs. Oh, are they? Yes. I thought they were my... No. Oh, good. <laughs> I oh, never sun... wouldn't sunbathe those. Sunbathe those. I caught those in a zip yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. It really is. It, it's that, you have to make the decision <laughs> of when you... Because you have to just yank that zip back down, don't you? Oh, yeah. It's, it's never happened to me. Has it not? No, it happens to me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all constantly getting my lallies, what I think lallies are, not what you think, <laughs> caught in uh, the old zippetage. It does. It's wowzers. Really? Yes. You but, should... Perhaps you should start wearing button-up trousers. Maybe I should start wearing pants. 
<laughs> that might be it. Do you not? Oh, you don't. Do you? Oh. Oh, how awful. Thank you very much indeed. 08459 455 555 is the phone number. We're still taking calls about Miss World and whether you think it's appropriate. But what, you're not doing that on your show this morning. No. You've got something else. No, you? coming up on the big phone in this morning, the news front pages today show an image of celebrity chef Nigella Lawson being grasped round the throat by her husband Charles Saatchi. Mr Saatchi had claimed the long lens photos showed a playful tiff but he's since accepted a police caution for assault. Ms Lawson has made no comment but has left the family home with her children. Charles Sarchi has told the press that Nigella has left to avoid the paparazzi. Well, this morning from nine on the big phone and I want your views on this. Could you ever forgive physical aggression in a relationship? If there was physical aggression in a relationship, if there was physical aggression showed, could you forgive it? Could you move on? Could you accept it? Does it necessarily mean that there would continue to be aggression? Or, in many relationships, does an incident happen, an argument, whatever, and things can become escalated? There can be a level of physical aggression, but it won't necessarily ever happen again, and it's worth giving things another chance. From nine this morning, I want your views on this, particularly if you've ever been in a relationship where there has been an episode of physical aggression. 08459 four double five five double five. Could you ever forgive it and move on with that relationship? The number of strong people, I'm saying people because it happens both ways, men and women, who I, I've seen who do stay longer in, in uh, aggressive relationships than perhaps you think they would is incredible. You, you think that... So many people I've seen, you think it happens once, they go, right, do you know what? You've crossed the line, I'm off. But people do stick in these relationships, don't they? But But I wonder how many people are listening to the programme now um, couples who perhaps have been together 20, 25 years. And actually, when they think back to when they first got together, when they were a bit younger, when they relate, you know, because there's always a, a period in relationships, isn't there? After you've been together for a couple of years and you start having those shakes and things start to go a little wrong and you're, you're wondering whether you're with the right person or not. And things can become sometimes quite heated. You can have quite heated arguments. I wonder how many people are listening to your programme this morning who, if they're honest years ago had an incident mm. of aggression but it's never happened since and if they had just ended the relationship then they would have missed out on you know 20 years of happy marriage yeah. since um or i wonder whether when someone demonstrates that that level of physical aggression whether ultimately the trust is broken and whether you can ever fully get a relationship back after that mm. i want to hear views from nine this morning on the big phone in Call 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. You can email uh, uh, Jonathan as well if you want. JVS show at bbc.co.uk. Now, a petition by a 28 year old disabled woman from Luton asking the government to continue funding social care has received more than 45,000 signatures. Well, Angela uh, Murray, who lost the use of her legs when she was hit by a car, has been helped in her campaign by the charity Scope. Well, both parties uh, uh, joined forces after coming across each other on this programme back in March. Let's speak to Angela first. Good morning, Angela. Hiya. Uh, what does the petition say, exactly? Um, it's a petition to get um, as much support as possible to try and get George Osborne to fund more social care. And just remind us of, of your situation, why this is so important to you. Um, well, it actually says it on the petition, but um, basically I had quite a few hours of my um, social care cut in February... Um, and I had to fight to get them back. Um, it's not the same since I have got it back. Um, there's a lot of restrictions put on it. Um, and I think there will be again when it gets cut again soon. And how did those changes to your social care affect you? Um, the times were really restricting. Um, I had to be in, indoors and in bed. At um, half past nine at night. And just to um, remind people, you, you're a 28 year old young woman. So being in bed at half past nine. Uh, is not necessarily the best, is not what you want in your lifestyle, is it? Not really, no. It kind of limited my life. And what kind of uh, help would the, the, the carers be giving you? What kind of things that, do you need them to help you do? Um, pretty much most things. Um, undressing, um, help with washing, personal care. I was, when I saw the 45,000 signatures uh, uh, that you got... I thought I was reading it wrong. 45,000 is an incredible amount, isn't it? It's an amazing amount. How, how did you get so many? Um, 
Obviously, a lot of people in England feel quite uh, passionately about social care. Mm. And what happens next, Angela? When, when does the petition get presented? Um, very soon. Um, I'm planning on making a drop with my local MP to um, 11 Downing Street. And that's, uh, that's Gavin Shuker, isn't it? Yes. And who's, who's behind this and supporting this. We'll stay there, Angela. We're joined now uh, by Daniel Maslia, who is from the Disability Chari- Charity Scope. Uh, Daniel, wh- what do you think of uh, what Angela's achieved? Um, well, we think Angela's amazing, to be honest. Um, she's having a real struggle um, with her own situation, as she just said, getting the right support from her council. But she's not just done a petition to get her support. She's done a petition to help the hundred odd thousand other disabled people in a really similar situation to her and she's she's galvanized an enormous amount of people um to to speak out and say that they think that in 2013 it's absolutely right that disabled people should get the support they need to get up and get dressed get washed and um and go about their lives. So, yeah, we think she's incredible. We've, we've heard Angela's story and how these uh, the, the cuts in her care package have affected her. What stories have you heard, Daniel? We've heard countless stories um, like those of Angela. Um, I mean, the, the big picture is that um, years of underfunding um, for social care mean that councils have been rationing the support they give to disabled people, and they're doing it in a couple of ways. They are squeezing the amount of people that are eligible in the first place to get it. Um, we did some research that's put that figure at about 70,000 people have just dropped out of the system altogether in the last few years. Then, even if you're in the system, and Angela is in the system, um, councils are squeezing and squeezing what they're giving people. So Ange- as Angela was saying, her care got cut from something like 20 hours down to three hours. Um, we did a survey and I think 40% of disabled people came back and said that they were getting some support, but it wasn't even enough for them to either get up, get washed, get dressed, get out. These are things, you know, these are really basic essentials of life. And um, what's, how, what is their justification for cutting back carers for these really important roles that we all take for granted? Yeah. Well, councils are in a real bind. Um, they're seeing their funding from central government squeezed and squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. Um, and they're then having to do their best with that really limited amount of money um, to continue supporting an ever-increasing number of people that need support because, um, you know, uh, society's getting older, there's more and more older people and there's more and more disabled people. Um, so they've got more people at the same time as having less money uh, and they're having to make sense of all of that. Um, so the crucial thing with all of this, though, is that the government has got a chance to put it right. Um, there's two things happening. They've got a bill going through Parliament, which is about improving the social care system. Um, crucially, at the moment, they're going to set a national level of eligibility. That means a national level for who's going to be in or out the system. At the moment, we're really worried that they're going to set it at a level that is too high, and about 100,000 people will find themselves falling out of the system, which we think is just totally wrong. Um, At the same time, there's a big spending review. So this is when the government's going to decide how much money it's going to allocate to different things. That's happening in two weeks. Now, if the government can put the right amount of money into social care, then it'll be able to set that eligibility level slightly lower. And it will mean that people like Angela and hundreds of thousands of other disabled people will all be able to get the support they need to do the basics. And And that's where Angela's petition comes in. Because it's not just her, it's not just Scope that's saying this. You know, that shows that there's an awful lot of people out there that all agree that right now, disabled people should get the basic support they need to get on with their life. Angela, is this petition going to work, do you think? Is, is it going to achieve the change you're hoping to get? Because of the amount of people that have signed it, I'm really quite positive about it. And if anybody else wants to sign it, can, can they? And, and how do they do that? Um, yes, there's um, Facebook links, there's, um, uh, it's in the local newspaper. Um, and I'm pretty sure there's a link um, on your website. I'm not sure. OK, well, we, we will... Ma- can I cut in? If you of course Google, you can. Um, Angela Murray, yep. um, petition and social care, you'll find it. It will come quickly. up there, brilliant. And we'll, we'll, we'll get a link and we'll put it on the Facebook page as well. Angela, Daniel, thank you very much uh, indeed. 45. Quite often we get people sending in stories. We've got a petition to um, save a tree. We've got 17 signatures. Oh, I, yeah, mm, yeah, that's not a story. 45,000 stories. And uh, Angela and Daniel came together as a result of this show. How's about that? 
Travel news for beds, cards and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. We have reports earlier this morning of a broken down car along the Bedford Southern Bypass, the A421 as you come toward the A6. Nothing recent's come in on that and traffic seems to be moving OK for the moment. Busy on the M1 though, southbound, slow moving Newport Pagnell toward Milton Keynes and delays from Luton toward Redbourne Junction 10 to 9. Anti-clockwise, the M25 is slowest from the M1 to the M4. From Junction 21 to 15, it could take you about an hour to get through the queue. The A10 looking very slow through Chesant. Delays from Great Cambridge Road at Turnford down toward the A121. of Maybe 15, 20 minutes through there. The A10 through Enfield is then looking very slow as well. Baltimore Lane to Southbury Road. You'll find queues in Dunstable. Slow moving traffic along the A5 around the A505 junction and through Watford it's slow moving on the Ring Road Exchange Road the A411 looking pretty busy as you go past Market Street train departure boards are not showing any problems and tubes into and out of London are running well Adam Glynn BBC Three Counties Radio Thank you very much Adam 8.30 News and Sport now with Catherine Boyle Across beds hearts and bugs This is BBC Three Counties Radio the headlines, leaders at the G8 summit in Enniskillen have been trying to bridge their differences on how to respond to the conflict in Syria. Police are looking for two teenagers who attacked a 15-year-old boy on the Marsh Farm estate with a plank of wood wrapped in barbed wire. And the art collector Charles Saatchi has admitted assaulting his wife, Nigella Lawson, during an argument outside a London restaurant. Three Counties Sports. BBC Three Counties Radio. Former Luton Town boss Joe Kinnear's in hot water after once again talking publicly about his as yet unconfirmed role as director of football at Newcastle United. Speaking on radio, he was asked to respond to the comments of fans unhappy about his return to the club. He responded by saying he had the contacts to pick up the phone and speak to any manager in the world and that he's due to meet Newcastle boss Alan Pardew today. Peter Odenwinge has told the BBC he expects to leave West Brom this summer. Odenwinge, who was heavily fined by West Brom for various comments on Twitter about the club last season, is looking to move on. We're talking now, my representatives, you know, are in uh, talks with uh, West Brom and uh, where we'll end up, I don't know yet, but most importantly, you know, if uh, I have a manager who will um, assure me of playing time, you know, it's the last years of my football career, I want to make sure I'm active. And Wickham Wanderers manager Gareth Ainsworth says he expects to bring in some new faces over the summer. You're in the region of sort of three uh, or four if we can um, to add to this and, uh, and we'll see, but there's parameters on that of, of how much we we uh, we pay players, and if we get players cheaper, we can sign more. If we if we sign big names, you, you know, it, it takes a bit chunk of the budget up, and we can only sign a few. Then so there's all sorts of things going on, but I've got a lot of bases covered. Finally, in rugby union, the British and Irish Lions play their final warm-up match ahead of Sunday's one test. Uh, sorry, first test against Australia at 10.30 this morning. They're taking on the Brumbies at Canberra in what uh, wing Shane Williams says will be the toughest match of the tour so far. Of course it's going to be difficult, but with professional rugby players, we've all got to make sure that we're fully prepared mentally for this game because, you know, we don't want to let anybody down. We want to go up there and give it 100%. It's going to be tough, but we're fully prepared to give it our all and do what we do best, really. And that's your latest news and sport. More from me at nine o'clock. Call 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. Morning, this is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. Here every weekday morning between six and nine at nine o'clock. Jonathan Vernon Smith comes in and does his thing. Coming up in the last 30 minutes, beauty pageants. Are they a little bit dated? Why is everyone staring at me? Have I done something? Everyone's staring at me into... Go, look the other way. Go on, don't look at me, for goodness sake. Is this a zoo? Think I'm in a zoo or something, guys? Hey, maybe this is a way we can make some money. We could charge people money to come and sit in there. Five pounds a ticket. People would pay. There are suckers out there. Uh, but before that, let's talk about Stuart Hall, shall we? The Shadow Attorney General has ha- asked for the 15 month jail sentence given to the BBC broadcaster Stuart Hall to be reviewed. He'd admitted indecently assaulting girls as young as nine over a 20 year period. Emily Thornbury has written to the Attorney General asking him to refer to what she calls the unduly lenient sentence to the Court of Appeal with a view to increasing it. Well, Peter Saunders is the Chief Executive of uh, NAPAC, the National Association for People Abused in Childhood. I spoke to him earlier. He's unhappy at the sentence, which he feels sends out the wrong message. It says we, we're not taking the judiciary and not taking these crimes seriously. Um, you know, it... it, it I can't think of a worse crime than to attack a child, particularly a young child, but any child, 
and then to be given, you know, if you or I went out and shoplifted Ian, I bet that's the sort of sentence we'd receive. Um, and yet somebody can steal the innocence of so many children and, and get away with a 15-month sentence. It, it sends, if, the, if, 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 if signal's the right word, it sends out a signal to, to other potential perpetrators that they might just get away with it, and even if they get caught, they're going to serve a few weeks in prison. It's not well, right. Justin Dealey has been out and about getting your reaction this morning. Justin, I, I think I can guess what people have been saying, but, but what have they said to Absolutely. you? Absolutely. I mean, I was shocked. Uh, you were shocked. We're talking here about 14 offences that occurred between 1967 and 1985. One of the girls, as you mentioned, was just nine years old. Now, the reason it was so low is because he was sentenced on the law as it was when he committed the offences, not not on the basis of the law now. I've been in Luton getting people's reaction. I've been asking them, was the sentence too lenient? And this is what people had to say. Yeah, it's way too lenient. Uh, it should have been a lot harsher at the end of the day. For what he's done, you know, she'd been treated like others have been treated. She should have been a lot more harsher. Regardless of his age, you know, he's done what he's done. He's got to pay the consequences. And when you were growing up, was Stuart Hall a bit of a hero of yours? Oh, yeah, yeah. I love watching him on telly, you know. It's a knockout and all that. He's great. He used to do the football and rugby. You, you know, you wouldn't dream that he's done it. It's not enough. I mean, why should he get away with it that much? You know, you'll be out in six months, or if that, you know. I don't think it's really bad. I think the whole world's gone crazy. I think it, it's very unfair. Those poor children... Now that adults, obviously, are still affected. They were our idols. Now that's all sad. It's gone. Um, I think it possibly was, yeah. I think maybe um, you need to send messages out to people that commit this sort of crime that they think they're above the law. Or I think that a message should be sent out and, the, and penalties should be much harsher. Yeah, I would say that is too lenient, yeah. I mean, you know, all right, he's, he's an old boy and that, and, but it's another case of we're putting him in the nick. And we're, we're paying to keep him again. You know, it's all wrong. Bring back the death penalty. So you're saying Stuart Hall should be killed? Not as conclusive of that, but yeah, bring back the death penalty. Absolutely. Other people like burglars and stuff like that, they get more longer than that. You know what I mean? It's just, it's just all wrong, mate. Uh, we, we, I, I'm not... Listen, this is one of the things I, I will not indulge the let's bring back the death penalty argument. I really don't think it, it warrants anything. But everybody there seemingly uh, suggesting, uh, Justin, that, that he it, he should have got a longer sentence. Yeah, absolutely. I think people are very, very angry about it, but also very sad about this as well, because when I think about my childhood, when I used to go to the football, I used to, to sit in the car with my dad and listen to Stuart Hall's football reports, because they were absolutely incredible. And now, when I look back, that memory means absolutely nothing to me. I just find the, the whole situation incredibly sad. Justin, I appreciate uh, you getting that report. Well, Jeremy Dean QC is a criminal defence barrister. Good morning, Jeremy. Good morning. Uh, Lots of comments in today's news about the length of this sentence. What do you think about it? Well, I think that all of us, myself included, have to be cautious about commenting on a sentence when none of us were in court and we didn't hear the precise detail and we weren't there to listen to the mitigating submissions made by um, Stuart Hall's counsel. So that's the precursor. Obviously, the sentence appears to be a lenient one, but the case was dealt with by a very experienced judge. Um, There are sentencing guidelines. A long time has passed. Stuart Hall is an old man. These are all factors the judge will have taken into account. And an experienced judge came to the view that this was the appropriate sentence. So you mentioned mitigating cir- circumstances. Would those have been the things you just mentioned? It happened 35, 40 years ago, and, and he's 83. Yeah, I imagine so. I mean, from the reports, um, what we're talking about here, and let me make it clear, I'm not, I'm not in any way seeking to undermine the gravity of these offences no. or the effect on the victims. And I, you know, I'm anxious to underline that. But what we're talking about is sexual assault in the guise of touching and kissing. And as I've said, there are levels of guidelines which dictate the level of sentence a judge has to pass. But I would have thought in this case, bearing in mind Stuart Hall's profile, that the only mitigation that could possibly have been relied on was the passage of time and his age. 
and those are factors the judge would take into account to a limited degree in reducing the sentence. I think another thing that, that, that was brought up in, in mitigation was the fact that um, all of the thir- all of the, his thirteen victims had had been involved in this case. You, you know, had come forward as opposed to Jimmy Savile's thirteen hundred. Yes, I mean, that was a point that was made according to reports. Um, I'm not sure myself how strong a mitigating factor that is, because from the perspective of the 13 victims, their trauma was their trauma, and it doesn't really matter that Jimmy Savile had, uh, on the face of it, an awful lot more. And I doubt whether that point is one that really influenced the judge. I suspect what, 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 what really brought the sentence down from what it otherwise might have been is the fact that in prison this morning is a frail old man and hardship for the elderly in prison is something which i think we all have to face up to however um in other however however much in other respects we think the sentence might have been longer there will be people saying of course jeremy well yes he may be a a frail 83 year old man but you know he touched up some young girls he did some pretty atrocious things yeah, I'm, as I've said, I, I mean, I, I, I acknowledge that, and, I, I, and, I, and I'm not in any way... Oh, no, no, I'm just, I'm just discussing this as though we were in a pub. You no, know, I'm not course. in any way holding you to account for no, this. No, 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 I know you're not, and I, 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 of course I fully understand the point, point you make, and it's, and, it, and, and, and it's a compelling point. But um, the, the reality of the situation is that when someone who is old goes to prison, and I don't know, but I suspect there was evidence to the effect that Stuart Hall would find prison very hard and possibly, um, you know, both, has both physical and, 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 and uh, well, certainly physical ailment at his age. I mean, what a judge has to do is to ask himself the question, you know, how are the public served by this old man remaining in prison for a very long time with all the expense that that would result in and the hardship that it was caused? And if I could just make this point, and I know the public feel in this case that a longer sentence was justified, but for an 83-year-old man, especially a man who's never been in trouble before, to be in prison, to be confined, to be locked up in a place surrounded by criminals for seven or eight months is going to be an an absolutely appalling experience for Stuart Hall. The Attorney General's office uh, says it's already had a small number of requests to review uh, uh, the sentence, including, I think, the Shadow Attorney General. Will that have any effect? Um, Well, I have to say, speaking for myself, that I'm not a fan of politicians getting involved in the sentencing process. I'm I'm strongly of the view that politicians um, ought to look after their business and let judges um, look after theirs and vice versa. Um, I doubt very much whether it will have much effect. Um, The test for the Attorney General in any case is whether he regards the sentences unduly lenient, that that will be the basis for the Attorney General's decision. Having said what I've said, I imagine that the weight of public opinion in this case, to the effect that the sentence was particularly lenient, is something that could, and I stress I don't know, tip the balance in favour of allowing the prosecution to appeal the sentence. What sentence? What what, what would the maximum, if this had just been a a normal gentleman in his 40s who had been caught with these historical, you're kind of playing a bit of a game here, but with these historical offences, what's the maximum sentence he could have got? Is it it two years per uh, uh, per, uh, incident? No, I, well, I think in relation to the various offences Stuart Hall pleaded guilty to, the, 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 there are different maximums right. for various of the offences. I, I believe that the maximum for some of them was five years at that time. Uh, the maximum has now increased. And could those five years, could they, all, could they run at one after each other? So it could, it could for example, be a 10-year sentence. Is that well, ever a possibility? Well, it is, it, it's a theoretical possibility. Right. The, the, the answer to the question, though, is that in reality, where an offender, and it doesn't matter whether it's this case or any case, has committed a series of similar offences um, over a, a period of time, usually speaking... Um, those sentences run side by side, and what, what, what the judge does is simply decide what the longest sentence should be to reflect the gravity of the offending. Jeremy, I appreciate your time this morning. Jeremy Dean is a, a QC, criminal defence barrister. You've got 15 minutes if you want to give us a call on that. Uh, 15 months, Jeremy's argument, and, and Jeremy is not involved with the case at all. He's coming from a legal standpoint, so I, I don't want anyone to think that I'm kind of arguing with him. We're, we're having a, a, a pub debate. 
Uh, but Jeremy's argument is, uh, the legal argument is, it, well, he's, he's an 83-year-old man. Is there really much point uh, in him serving much longer? It's going to be a horrific experience for him. No doubt he's going to be, some prison justice will be meted out. Jeremy's also, uh, other point was that, well, he's not been in trouble with the police before. I would counter, that's because he's not been caught before. He's been doing these things for a long time, but he's not been caught before. What do you think? 08459 four double five five double five. 555. Stuart Hall, does he deserve longer? Is 15 months. For an old man, he won't serve 15 months. What will he serve? Five months, probably? 83-year-old man. Is that long enough? And I, I, I will not entertain people calling up and saying, hey, guys, let's bring back the death penalty. No, 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 no. It's not going to happen. And it doesn't work at all. 08459 four double five five double five is the phone number. Travel news for beds, cards and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. Just having a look at the public transport situation. So far, trains are still running well. We have nothing running more than a couple of minutes late anywhere across the Three Counties at the moment. It's all looking good if you're heading into London and making a connection with the underground. Tubes are running well. On the roads, the M1 southbound still slow moving from Newport Pagnell toward Milton Keynes at Junction 14. Delays from Junction 11 for the A505 down toward 10 at Luton Airport. And the anti-clockwise M25 very slow from the M1 at Junction 21 round to the M4 at Junction 15. It could take an hour to get through the queues there. A1 delays. First off, you've got queues coming down toward the Black Cat roundabout in Roxton. The A1M is slow moving from Hitchin to Stevenage, then into London. A1 delays through Boreham Wood from Stirling Corner to Mill Hill Circus. And things are starting to get quite busy in High Wycombe. The A404 looking slow as you come from the M40. Adam Gloon, BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you, Adam. It's 8.46 or thereabouts. It's Tuesday the 18th of June. I'm Ian Lee. These are your headlines on BBC Three Counties Radio. Leaders at the G8 summit in Enniskillen have been trying to bridge their differences on how to respond to the conflict in Syria. The art collector, Charles Saatchi, has admitted assaulting his wife, Nigella Lawson, during an argument outside a London restaurant. In sport, the British and Irish Lions play their final warm-up match ahead of Saturday's first test against Australia at 10.30 this morning. Coming up, I'll talk to relationship writer Jane Butterworth about art collector Charles Saatchi. There are images of him grasping his wife, Nigella Lawson, by the neck in newspapers this morning. Before that, though, here's the weather with Kate Kinsella. Beds, hearts and bucks weather. BBC Three Counties Radio. Good morning. Well, we've had a bit of brightness out there this morning. We've still got some further east, however, towards parts of Hertfordshire and Buckingham. And indeed, Bedfordshire, everywhere, we're starting to see that cloud start to increase. And one or two showers are starting to pop up as well. And this is going to continue through the course of the morning. However, it's not going to impact the temperature. It's going to be a really nice warm day. 23 Celsius, 73 degrees in Fahrenheit, despite the cloud and despite a few heavy showers. Now, overnight, we're hanging on to the cloud again one or two scattered showers likely especially towards the early hours of tomorrow morning we could get one or two pop up again but the minimum temperature a muggy 13 celsius 55 degrees in fahrenheit a similar day tomorrow some brighter spells though and it's going to get warmer particularly in towns we're looking at 25 celsius 77 degrees in fahrenheit but then of course it's all changed for thursday some cooler air and we'll start to see some rather prolonged heavy spells of rain arriving that's your forecast thank you very much If you've missed any of the programmes from the last week, you've missed things like this. It was awful, because I think my dad, I don't know whether he, I think he was the first celebrity, really, to sort of get sectioned. But there is a way you can hear it all again. I'm about to speak to Rachel Bruno. She was just 16 years old when her very famous father was sectioned. Go to bbc.co.uk slash three counties and click on Listen Again. All of our programmes are available for seven days, allowing you to listen to what you missed or things you'd love. Love to hear again. Love to hear again. BBC.co.uk slash three counties. Don't forget, uh, you can go and download my podcast as well. What's a podcast? Well, it's a handy way of carrying the show around in your pocket on an iPod or any other MP3 player, although iPods are probably the best. Telephones, computers, you name it. Go to iTunes, type in Ian Lee, BBC, it pops up, download it. There are four of them. Oh, and if you leave nice comments, it makes us look good in the charts as well. Thank you. On the subject of Stuart Hall, Lynn is in Hazelmere. Morning, Lynn. Good morning. Fifteen months, is it long enough? No, not at all. Um, I just 
I'm not saying anything about the, the judge or anything, but to be honest, I think our system is a bit skewed now because he did the crime. How are those people that he abused going to feel? He's got away with that all his life. He's had a lovely, lovely celebrity life, thank you very much. And he did that, and he got away with it, and he's got so such a small sentence. It's terrible. What about the argument that uh, he's an 83-year-old man, an 83-year-old man going what? to prison? Well, he did the crime. I'm sorry. He's got away with it until now. He should be treated like everybody else. I'm sorry. I usually stand up for pensioners. I'm the first one to shout, leave the pensioners alone. But, oh, excuse me. Bye. Um, sorry? Oh, sorry, I was saying goodbye to everybody. They're oh. all toddling off. Um... But I think, you know, it's ridiculous. If you do the crime, you do the time. End of. Have a listen to this. This is a, an email from Sue who says, uh, Whilst I deplore the sentence of Stuart Hall, we have to remember the law in this. The crimes he committed had a shorter term back then. Think of it like this. If you did something that was legal 20 years ago, would you want to be prosecuted now if it's now illegal? That would not be right. After all, there is a statute of limitations to protect people in such cases. I think Hall's sentence says far more about us as a society 30 years ago and how we treated children and women. We should be grateful we've moved on. Yes, we are. We are very grateful that we've moved on because it was just in the 70s, you know, everybody had their bottom pinched, etc. by some dirty old man and it was accepted, you know, especially in the workplace. You just thought, oh, well, get on with it. But to be honest, we have moved on as a society. He did do the crime and he should be punished properly for it just because he's old now. Um, he's had such a lovely life. That's what makes me so mad that he got away with it for so long. Lynn, stay there. I want to bring in uh, Ian in Northampton into this. Ian, you disagree? I disagree. Um, as far as I, I can read it, the sentencing range was between two and five years. Um, he has to be given a third off the sentence for credit. So if you take the lowest end, which is... By, yeah. by credit, you mean because he, he pleaded guilty at some point? Even guilty. though initially he came out and said everyone was a liar? Yes, but his, um, his, his first chance to plea is the plea and case management hearing. And if he pleads guilty then, then that is given, ma is given maximum credit. Had he gone to trial and had he pleaded guilty at the start of a trial, or before a trial, then he'd have got 10%. So if you're looking at a range of two to five years, take a third off the two years, it's 16 months. So, if you then factor in his age... Yeah. What? ...that 15 months is about right. Why, why, would, why should we factor in his age? Because uh, you, you, you have to have... The court has to give him some sort of mercy for his age and for his... Why? His, um, he, he groped... I'm reading here the, in the mail. He groped a nine-year-old as he read her a bedtime story. Yeah, it's disgusting. I'm not... I'm not, um, I'm not sticking up for what he did. But he what told I'm a girl of ten, cuddle me like your teddy. Yeah, it's disgusting. It's absolutely terrible. But you've got to look and, and look how the, the, the um, law was back then. And it's the sentencing range is two to five years. It's not the judge's fault. It's the, 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 the law at the time. And that has been changed now. But and had he committed these offences more recently, it would have been given longer. But, but, but 15 months is nowhere near five years. And, and you're right, if you, t you take some of it off because he pleaded guilty, that's the way it works. But it's still nowhere near five years, is it? The sentencing range is between two and five years. The, the five-year sentence would be for um, somebody that had pre uh, committed offences like this previously, for instance, which he hadn't. He had a clean record. Um, so your five is with a number of aggravating features. And... I've got to be, there aren't the aggravating features in this case, and there's a lot of mitigating features, where, such as his age, such as his, his guilty plea, such as um, his, his good record. Lynn, what do you think? Well, I think, to be honest, then, we need to look at our system in the country. It's wrong, isn't it? People get more, more for shoplifting and robbing banks and all that sort of stuff. And what this guy has done has had a lasting effect on all those people that have, you know, been affected by it. I think it's despicable. We need to look at our, our, our law in this country. Uh, Lynn, uh, in Hazelwood, Ian in Northampton, thank you very much. Mick says, Stuart Hall should have been sentenced to at least eight years. His age or the time lapse of the assaults shouldn't be taken into consideration. He's an arrogant paedophile and justice hasn't been done. It, I mean, you, you look at some of the, the, the things he's done. And I don't want to go into too much detail because we have young ears and I don't particularly want to, uh, you know, go into the detail. Can you put this into a chart? No, of course you can't. But, 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 
his crimes could be compared to Jimmy Savile's uh, uh, and could be looked at as not being quite as, as intense or serious as, as Jimmy Savile's crimes. That's not in any way to demean what he's done. OK. Um, as far as I know, there was no full sex. That's what, what I'm trying to, uh, to get at. That, of course, does not in any way demean what he's done in the slightest. Uh, he has done some hideous things. Girl 9, he groped as he read a bedtime story. Girl 10, he told, cuddle me like your teddy. Dancer 15, uh, attacked after joining BBC Slim campaign. You, you do have to wonder, don't you? Uh, 08459 455 555. You've, you've got a couple of minutes if you want to come in. Jill's in Biggleswake. Good morning, Jill. Oh, good morning. Jill, what, what do you think? 15 months, is it long enough? Uh, well, I'm not really interested in, 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 in um, the, the length of time he's got. My, my point is this, that I don't think anybody's made previously, that had he been um, caught doing what he was doing and been sentenced when he was doing it, his career would have been over and he wouldn't have enjoyed the lifestyle that he's enjoyed for the last 40 years. And uh, that's correct. And I, I, I think that, that, that is, is an adequate punishment. What, what's an adequate punishment, sorry? Uh, ha- having his life ruined for what he's done. OK, well, his life ruined now. He, he has got away with it for 40 years. He's yes, had... I know, but what I'm saying is he's lived the life of Riley since he's done it, hasn't yeah. he? Yeah. And uh, it hasn't affected his lifestyle at all. I mean, he's 83 now. He's lucky to have got to 83. Yeah. And uh, I, I think that had he, had, had he been um, tried and found guilty uh, when he committed the crime, his, his career would have been over. But his career wasn't over, was it? Because no, he got away with it. Yes. So, so maybe we should put him in prison for longer to make him suffer. Uh, 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 yes, well, there is that to it. But, but what I'm saying is it's all happened too late. Had, had he been caught when he did it, he 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 would have um, his lifestyle would have been over and and that would have been a punishment as well. Yeah. I mean he should have gone into jail. Granted, and if if the punishment was fifteen months then, uh, as it's they're saying it was, I mean that's fine. But a presenter with his profile and um, uh, when he'd done fifteen months for 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 child abuse. I mean, his career would have been over. I what? mean, he's not really suffered at all. He's going to get 15 months, and he's going to be out in about six. One of his arguments was that it's all a bit of a witch hunt after Jimmy Savile. What do you think? Well, no, I wouldn't agree with that. If you've done something like that, you, you should be prepared to answer for it, I feel. Uh, Jill, thank you very much. Ray's in. Until the last voice we'll hear on this uh, this morning. What, what do you think about Stuart Hall's sentencing, Ray? Well, I, first of all, I don't think we have the right to comment because the judge sees all the facts and he hears all the mitigation. We just see the press. Yeah, we do have a, we do have a right to, to comment on, on how long a paedophile gets in prison, surely. Well, yes, we have the right to have an opinion, but we yes. shouldn't j- uh, sway the judiciary with our opinions. It should be up to the judiciary. That's what they're there for. Oh, OK. But, well, we're not swaying them because the decision has been made. But yes, I take your point. Yeah, but what I would say is, is how we view sentencing in this country. Do we see it as a revenge thing or... Or are people put in prison to protect society? Now, you can't say at 83 years old, this man is a menace to society anymore. So we shouldn't send him to prison at all? Yes, we should send him to prison, but we should, we should not be looking for revenge. There's some very emotive words used on here. We can be looking, not necess- I don't think revenge has been mentioned, but we can look at, at punishment, can't we? No, I think people are emotive because it's children and everything else. They were, you know, it's the Hangham and, and you know, Brandon Brigade. But I think you've got to say to yourself, OK, what is prison for? No, Rehabilitation and punishment? Yes, but he's 83. So we shouldn't punish an 83-year-old man? Yes, you should punish him, but you should take it in context. You should say, OK, look... What about the not... 9-year-old girl whose life he ruined? Yes, but that's been 40 years ago. OK, so she's had 40 years of hell. Yes, but why hasn't she reported it for 40 years? Because, do you know, it's really difficult if someone's been abused by an adult, particularly a celebrity, it's really difficult to come forward, Ray, because of the shame and the guilt that that child feels. Yes, but she wasn't on her own. There was a lot of them, and I'm not one of these people that subscribes. Well, but a lot it. of those children then felt shame and guilt at being abused by a, a, a man and a celebrity. So, so uh, uh, it does. It can be very difficult to come forward if you're a victim of abuse like that. Yeah, I can understand with the prevailing um, attitudes in the 70s or 80s, but in the last 20 years, things are much more open. They could have come forward then. Right. We, we have to end it there. It's a discussion for another day because it, it's not as simple uh, as that. I think for victims of abuse, but. Travel news for beds, cards and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. Adam Blinn. 
Thank you very much, Ian. M25 anti-clockwise, slow moving into the roadworks, Waltham Abbey to Enfield, then busy from Watford to the M4, junction 19 to 15. So easing just a little bit because it was tailing back all the way to the M1 at junction 21. Clockwise is starting to slow up into the roadworks now as well from the A1M toward Potter's Bar. Southbound, the M1 is slow from Newport Pagnell toward Milton Keynes. The A1 has queues at the Black Cat roundabout in Roxton. The A1M then slow from Hitchin towards Stevenage Junction 8 to 7 on the speed sensors. And into London, the A1 is looking busy through Boreham Wood. Stirling Corner to Mill Hill Circus, there are queuing traffic on the cameras around there. And if you're coming toward London on the A10, southbound through Chesant, it's still looking slow from the Great Cambridge Road down toward Winston Churchill Way. Train departure boards, everything looking good. No problems or delays for the tubes in or out of London. Adam Glynn, BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you very much, Adam. Thank you, everyone, who took part in the show this morning. Don't forget, you can carry on having your say either by going to the Facebook page or by sending me an email, ian.lee at bbc.co.uk. Back tomorrow at six. Stick around. JVS is up next. Until tomorrow from me, ta-ta. On FM, AM, online and digital radio. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you, Ian. Good morning. Welcome to the JVS Show. I'm Jonathan Vernon-Smith. And on this morning's big phone-in, could you ever forgive physical aggression in a relationship? The news front page is...